We're live streaming, everybody. How's it going, live streamers? The Ben Jarofsky Show for your Wednesday, March 20th, is moments away. But before we get going, we would like to thank the following unions for making this show possible. The International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, not Aerosmith, Local 126 and District 8. The International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 9. And the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 150. Thank you once again to those unions for jumping on board with us in this podcasting venture. And of course, today's show is brought to you by our friends at the Chicago Federation of Labor. With that said, the Ben Jarofsky Show starts now. <laughs> he loves snapping. It is Wednesday, March 20th, and live from the Chicago Reader's Chicago Suntime Studio on Racine Avenue, <laughs> this is the Ben Jarofsky <laughs> Show. He's trying so hard not to snap. <laughs> Today on the program, it's In These Times writer Miles Komplassen, and we welcome 38th Ward Alderman Nick Spazzato. <laughs> and now your host, lover of snapping, <laughs> Chicago Reader columnist Ben Jarofsky. Hello everybody, Ben Jarofsky here. We're calling this Geek Out Wednesday. And here's why. A few days ago, I cited a great column by Eric Zorn in the Tribune. Yes, yes, everybody. I do indeed read the Tribunal. I have it home delivered every day. Part of my mission to single-handedly, personally, keep alive the newspaper industry. Thank you, newspaper writers everywhere. Anyway, the theme of Eric's original essay was that there's not really a dime's worth of difference between Tony and Lori. So you might as well flip a coin before voting for one or another. Well, that was not Eric's conclusion. It's more like the one I drew. Hold on. I got to have a drink of water. Yeah, take a drink of water there. Sound a little parched. <clears throat> nice. Man, they got good water here at the Sun Time. You ever notice that, D? The water fountain is excellent. Unbelievable. What? Can we give a little a shout out to the water fountain? <laughs> anyway, where was I? Oh, yes. Eric Zorn. Today, he followed up with another column which I have right in front of me. The real column, folks. I'm not reading off some phone. Real newspaper, all right? Yeah, he's old, guys. <laughs> oh, millennials are like, I never buy a newspaper. <laughs> I'm saving 50 cents or whatever it costs these days. Anyway, <laughs> he followed up with a classic clarification. Eric, having plowed their pos through the position papers, a task Worthy of a raise. Hey, Tribune, give Eric a raise for having plowed through those position papers. Anyway, having plowed through those position papers, Eric has discerned several rather obscure but important policy distinctions between Lori and Tony. All right? And that gives me the opportunity to take the deep dive into political geekdom. Oh, yay. <laughs> A place I love to swim about. Yes, yes, folks. Is there enough of a distinction between Lori Lightfoot and Tony Preckwinkle to warrant a vote for one over the other? All right. You ready to take this dive, Dennis? Are you ready? Yes. All right, hold it. <clears throat> I'm going to do the Rocky theme to get ready. Da -da -da. Woo! Did it? Okay, okay. That, that'll be it up there. Let's get to the story. Hold on. Now, let me take that. You know, what did Rocky have? Like an egg? Didn't he put the <laughs> yeah. egg in milk? Was it milk that he put the egg in? I have no clue. No, he, a raw egg. Right? All right. Hold on. I'm going to drink the raw egg with milk. Hang tight, Eric Zorn. Okay. You're gonna, we'll get there. Oh, hold on. I put it in the blender. <laughs> ah, the raw egg. I think it was raw egg and milk. Yeah, one of our you know listeners out there in All Facebook right. land. He's in some kind of mood today. <clears throat> oh, yeah. I'm ready. Here we go. Political geekdom. All right. Five key differences between Preckwinkle and Lightfoot as discerned by Eric Zorn having plowed through their position papers. God bless you, Eric. You did it so I don't have to. Number one, rent control. All right. He sees a difference. There's a difference on rent control. Preckwinkle wants a repeal of a state law prohibiting lo local governments from opposing rent control. Lightfoot, on the other hand, has a 10-page affordable housing plan that doesn't mention rent control. That's a classic duck and dodge. I'll spend 10 pages talking about other things so that you forget that I'm not really taking a stand on rent control. Uh, anyway, long-term, Lightfoot is right to stress a supply solution 
And I share the concerns of those who fear that rent control measures would impede rather than foster the growth of affordable housing. But I also share Park Winkle's view, supported by 71% of voters in the 18 city precincts where the issue was put to, put to them in an advisory referendum, that localities should be free to debate this issue. I say this about that. Since neither one of these candidates will lift a finger to get the state to pass rent control, it's a meaningless distinction because <laughs> they're not going to do anything about this, Eric. So I don't think this is reason or gives you reason to vote for one or the other. Move on to number two, city council term limits. Mm-hmm, term limits, D. Uh, Eric points out that Preckwinkle is opposed to term limits, saying in a candidate survey that voters are, quote, given the opportunity to choose their elected officials with each election. That is true. Lightfoot wants mayors and city council committee chairs limited to two turns. Again, I'm in the middle. I'm reading Eric. Legislative leadership positions are not subjected to direct democracies and so should be terminated. Wait, hold on, hold on. Rocky just drank a glass of raw eggs. That's it. Nothing else. No milk. <laughs> There's Thanks, no Frank. milk in there? Shout out to Frank. Thanks, buddy. Uh, fr- Hi, Frank. Yeah. Frank, hide out, Frank. Hide out, Frank. Frank, thank you for that. It was just, but he blended it, I think, Frank. He put the blender. Anyway, where was I? Rent control. Important things here. All right. No, uh, city council term limits. All right, now here's my position on city council term limits. I'm all over the map. I'm like Eric Zorn. The wind blows this way, I go that way. The wind blows that way, I go that way. I voted for Pat Quinn's term limit referendum for the mayor. So here's my position. Until we are dis- until we learn what that vote was, because they've buried that vote, folks. <laughs> Everybody forgot that one, huh? Yeah, they buried that one. Until we know how what we how we voted on term limits for mayor, this is not an issue worth discerning, uh, making a distinction. Excuse me between uh, Tony Perico and Lightfoot. So move on. Aldermanic side jobs. That's an interesting distinction. D. I did not know this distinction existed. Uh, thank you, Eric Zorn, for pointing this out. Preckwinkle has opposed a ban on aldermen holding outside jobs, saying such employment poses too many p- potential conflicts of interest. Lightfoot's proposal is to limit the ban to jobs that pose actual conflicts with official duties. Both have the same goal, Eric writes, but Preckwinkle's plan is clearer and more easily enforced. Conflicts of interest are broad, insidious, and difficult to tease out and tamp down. Even Preckwinkle's total ban wouldn't el- eliminate spousal and family conflicts, but it would be a good start. Ah, you know what, D? I think there should be abandoned side jobs for aldermen. Of course, that's easy for me to say. I'm not an alderman, but whatever. I oh, think. Thank they- God. <laughs> so uh, you know what? If this is the issue that floats your boat, as the great Helena Appleton, one of my uh, uh, dearest friends from the '80s, would say, then you should vote for Tony Preckwinkle. If this is the issue that floats your boat. Uh, then you should vote for Tony Pregwinkle. Of course, it's not the number one issue on my plate, so it's not enough to get me to vote for one or the other. All right, here we go. Issue number four. Independently drawn political maps. Oh, this is really getting in the geekdom country, and I love going here. Right now, folks, the uh, the ward boundaries are drawn every 10 years by the alderman working in conjunction with the mayor, and it's a way the mayor controls the alderman. Because if the mayor draws an unfavorable map to the alderman, the alderman's pretty much screwed in the next election. So this explains why in 2011, the city council voted 50 to nothing for Rahm's horrific, terrible first budget that closed those clinics. It's shame, shame, shame on Rahm and the alderman and the entire city. We did not rise up against that. By the way, noticeably absent from that struggle, I just have to point this out was Tony Prankwinkle and Lori Lightfoot. Neither one were ever to be were to found on the front lines on that very important issue. Anyway, just pointing that out, D, all right? Anyway, uh, let's see. Independently drawn maps. Lightfoot's position from a candidate survey. I support the creation of a nonpartisan independent city council ward map redistricting processes that is open to and transparent. Prankwinkle position is, I believe, a remap of city ward should stay within the city council. Well, that's understandable. Tony was an alderman for many, many years, and she understands the political realities that aldermen face. <clears throat> uh, what is Eric's position on this one? My position, uh, I am touched, this is Eric, by Preckwinkle's civics class view of the motives of office holders tasked with drawing the legislative boundaries that are key to the political sur- survival. But come on, Lightfoot has the right idea. That's pretty funny. Uh, civics class view. I'm sorry, Eric. I, on this point, I do not believe 
that there's a possibility in the city of Chicago to have a nonpartisan, nonpartisan body. Oh, the thing does not exist. I'm sorry, does not exist. So here's what I say. Let's have Brian, the, the tech guru that oh. sets up this show. Let him set up the computers and just let the computers spit it out, right? All right, let's give it to Brian. All right. Either way, it's not enough of the distinction for me to decide which one to vote for. Finally, we get to automatic privilege and prerogative, and this is <laughs> this is the one where supposedly aldermen have the control over zoning in their wards and how terrible that is. It suddenly emerged as an issue in the last few months out of nowhere. Uh, generally, Lightfoot opposes this, according to Eric, and Preckwinkle supports the time-honored, occasionally abused tradition that gives aldermen nearly king-like powers over development, zoning, and per- permitting issues in their wards. I say this about that. It is a phony issue. It's been made up. It doesn't really exist. Aldermen do not repeat, do not have king-like or queen-like control over all uh, zoning decisions and their wards. They only have the appearance of such decisions. It's something the mayor gives them until the mayor pulls it away. And guess what? Then they don't have it. And if you want proof of this, take a look at the debate in 2007, was it, D? Over at the Children's Museum in Grant Park, which I think buried once and for all, should have buried once and for all, this notion that aldermen are king or queens of zoning and award. The local alderman, Brendan O'Reilly, was against the Children's Museum coming to uh, Grant Park. The mayor, Daly, at the time said he wanted it there, and they had a showdown vote. Guess what? All the aldermen <laughs> sided with Daly over uh, Alderman Riley. So, so much for aldermanic privilege and prerogative. It does not exist. It never has existed. It only exists so long as the mayor allows it. Anyway, not enough a distinction there for me to uh, vote for one or the other. So I am like that proverbial flag still blowing in the breeze on this election. Thank you, Eric, for the entertaining column, and I always enjoy the deep dive into geekdom. We got a great show today, everybody. Politics, politics, politics. That's what we'll be talking about. Miles Camp Lassen from In These Times. This guy's a pretty smart dude. He he was on the last show. Pretty smart guy. He knows a lot about politics. He'll be helping us connect all the dots and what's going down. Uh, in this upcoming election. Eh, we may do a little national talk as well with Miles once we got him in the studio to talk about what uh, what to expect. The, the, the presidential campaign is just around the corner, folks. What do I look? Uh-oh, I see April 3rd. That, oh. See that thing over there, D? Yeah. That's April 3rd. Oh. You know what April 3rd means? It's a day after April 2nd. Oh, I can't <laughs> wait for that. <laughs> but it's the day after the mayoral election. So we shift gears. Yeah, we're heading into showdown country, folks. Democrats are going to try to go after Trump. So who's the best candidate to do that? Yep, that's the discussion up ahead. It's going to consume us for many months. Also on the show, Alderman Nick Spazzato from the 38th Ward. Nick may be the most conservative alderman in Chicago City Council, uh, but he's an old buddy of mine, and I'm not throwing him under a bus, all right? I'm just not that kind of guy. Nick Spazzato will be in the studio uh, around 2 o'clock or so. And uh, more political talk, 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 because we love talking politics before we do any of that. The doctor has the news. Hey, how's it going, everybody? I'm Dennis. It's the middle of the day. Let's talk about the news happening nationally this afternoon. And then after that, we have some Facebook and Twitter Elizabeth Warren poll results to read. Ben, I know you're excited. He called me up at like midnight last night. Man, I can't wait to talk about these results, D. Man. Okay, cool. Calm down. Go to bed. (laughs) Let's talk about the national news here. That's actually sort of true. (laughs) In the news today, Uh, nothing new here. mm -hmm. Our president is tweeting like a psychopath again. Yeah, just your average Wednesday, trash-talking recently past Mm -hmm. senators and, uh, you know, the husband of the lady who's been right there with him since he ran. Oh, and uh, let us not forget the uh, Russian collusion. No collusion. (laughs) Sorry, no collusion. Oh, no, yeah, that's in that investigation. Yeah, let's end that one because, you know, Donald says no collusion, all right? Let's end it. Okay, it's over. Let me move on. So your thoughts on uh, McCain and Trump? Oh, well, all right. Listen, um, Donald Trump, I think, is certifiably insane on the issue of John McCain. All right, folks, let me just uh, talk about this one more time. Uh, John McCain, of course, is the late senator from the state of Arizona. He was a uh, um, a distinguished uh, Navy pilot. He spent seven years in captivity. He was shot. His plane was shot down. And he was held captive. Uh, by the North Vietnamese during the Vietnam War. Uh, Donald John Trump did not serve in, in the military. Uh, I think his toe hurt. Is, did his toe hurt or was his finger? 
Bone spurs. Oh, bone spurs. I'm sorry. I thought his, his, his toe hurt. I'm sorry. So he did not uh, serve in the Vietnam War, and yet he has seen fit to denigrate uh, John McCain and the service that John McCain gave. Uh, you could argue uh, that uh, that war was a, a, a war that should never have been waged, and nobody should have served. You can make that argument if you want. Fine, make that argument. But I'll also point out that Donald John Trump did not uh, p- protest against the war. He did not join the anti-war movement. He didn't do anything uh, to try to bring that war to an end. All he did was avoid taking a stand one way or another, either fighting in the war or fighting to end the war, okay? So his most cowardly position one could take, he took it. And now, years later, he's denigrating the reputation of John McCain, who's not alive, to defend himself continually. Why? I agree with Meghan McCain as to why uh, Donald Trump continually denigrates uh, John McCain, and that's because he's jealous of him. He's envious of him. Uh, he realizes that John McCain is more of an American hero than he, Donald John Trump, will ever be. And so uh, he just feels compelled. He can't help himself. It's like an instinct he has to denigrate John McCain. McCain. And with I listen, he's a lunatic. We all know he's a lunatic. The real question is why does the Republican party still support him what is it 90 percent of republican voters slave-like in their devotion and dedication to uh donald trump it's even it exceeds anything that i've seen even in the city of chicago with the love that chicagoans have for like mayor daly or mayor rom in the north side anyway (laughs) like the 42nd war loves mayor rom the 40th we love mayor rom anyway i think the real um the real disgrace it lies with Republicans who continue to support Donald Trump, uh, even in, after all the uh, in disgusting tweets he makes about John McCain. All right. Trump was asked about his statements towards John McCain. Here's the president. President, why are you attacking Senator John McCain? Seven I'm very unhappy that he didn't repeal and replace Obamacare, as you know. He campaigned on repealing and replacing Obamacare for years. And then he got to a vote and he said, thumbs down. And our country would have saved a trillion dollars and we would have had great health care. So he campaigned. He told us hours before that he was going to repeal and replace. And then for some reason, I think I understand the reason, he ended up going thumbs up. And frankly, had we even known that, I think we would have gotten a vote because we could have gotten somebody else. So I I think that's disgraceful. Uh, Plus, there are other things. I was never a fan of John McCain and I never will be. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. (laughs) I love how the, the press is just screaming at him as he leaves. Uh, okay, first of all, I'm sure that most of that was just made up about in terms of what he said to Trump, how he misled Trump, et cetera, et cetera. You know, can't believe a thing that Trump says. That said, the reality is I remember that vote quite clearly, D. I remember talking about it with you and our listeners uh, on the old show uh, at great length. The reality is this. Trump and the Republican Party had nothing to replace Obamacare with. If you take away Obamacare, there would be no health care for folks who didn't have it through their jobs. That's a reality. That's a fact. He did the right thing John McCain did by uh, putting his thumb down to Donald Trump and the Republicans' efforts to blow up Obamacare. That was a misguided effort from the get-go. The the effort to blow up Obamacare bred from just this knee-jerk hatred for all things Barack Obama, probably because he's a black man. But let's put that one to the side for the moment. And John McCain did the right thing. He did the right thing to put the thumb down. Everybody knows it. Even Republicans know it because it would have been a political disaster to snatch away an insurance plan that many people depend on uh, if, and replace it with nothing. Republicans know that. So that was all political posturing on the part of Trump and the Republican Party. And for him to continue, for Donald Trump to continue bashing John McCain for doing the right thing. Well, like I said before, the real issue is why do Republicans put up with it? In other news nationally, Ben, we didn't really touch on this one uh, yesterday. During her town hall speech in Jackson, Mississippi, Senator and Democratic POTUS hopeful Elizabeth Warren became the first candidate to publicly announce the desire to abolish the electoral college process in our voting system. Ben, before we move on, abolish the electoral college. Agree or disagree? Oh, completely agree. What? That thing's ridiculous, man. What? What? Even hockey, all right? Even hockey where they, like, give points out if you get a tie, you know what I mean? If you get more goals, you win the game. If you get more votes, you should win the election. It's cockamamie system set up hey, to— watch your mouth. 
This cock may be system set up to defend the, the rights of slave owners in the you know, like the 18th century should have been abolished years ago. By the way, you know who would be leading the charge to abolish it if the election had gone the other way? The Republicans. So, you know, Donnie Trump, that was one of his tweets over the weekend, D. I don't know if you saw that. I want to abolish the electoral he was like, well, it really works because it makes me have to go after, uh, you know, the little states. Oh, yeah, Donnie, would you be saying that if Michigan, Wisconsin had gone the other way and you had lost the election? Oh, my God. You'd be ranting and railing. Now, being the first candidate to make such an announcement like abolishing the Electoral College, yeah, that'll guarantee you some headline news coverage. Yeah, but when you're the second candidate, not so much, I'm imagining. But nevertheless, former HUD secretary and San Antonio mayor Julian Castro became the latest Democratic presidential candidate to endorse getting rid of the Electoral College. Yeah, well, like I said before, this was, there's some uh, overlaps with the rent control discussion I was having uh, earlier in the city of Chicago. I don't believe any of these candidates will actually lift a finger to, if they get elected to abolish it because there's so many other pressing issues that they'll be facing. But symbolically, it's good. It's like red meat thrown at Ben. Yeah! <laughs> Now, of so course, we will whatever. keep you posted on these stories as today's program rolls right along. Mm-hmm. Now, this is typically the time where I ask our host, Benny J, if he's ready to find out what's going on in Chicago and or Illinois and our segment, What Else is News? And we're going to do that. We're going to cover the local news. But Benny J, are you also ready to find out the results of our Twitter and Facebook Elizabeth Warren poll? I <laughs> I was going to say I was born ready, but I've been staying up all night ready for it. That's <laughs> one know. of the things I was waiting oh for. Oh, my God. Leave me alone. I'm trying to go to sleep, I man. kept calling him. D, what are the results? Not telling oh, you now. Lord. Go back to bed. Go to bed, please. Oh, but God, that's great, dude. though, because coming up after this short little break, we will read those poll results, and we will find out what else is news. Uh, I can't wait. This is the time of day when the doctor plucks that little trick out of his little sleeve. Let's see what it is when we return. Hi, this is Nick Offerman. I'm taking my show on the road and subjugating an audience to my humor. All rise, American humorist Nick Offerman is coming September 15th on stage at the Chicago Theater. It's an evening of deliberative talking and light dance that will compel you to chuckle while enjoining you to brandish a better side of humanity than the one to which we have grown accustomed. Reserved seats are on sale noon Friday, March 22nd at the box office or at Ticketmaster.com. Don't miss Nick Offerman live. Hey, welcome back, everybody. And speaking of Nick Offerman live... September 15th at the Chicago Theater, our second ticket giveaway for Nick Offerman at the Chicago Theater, Sunday, September 15th, will be happening at 2 o'clock, 2 o'clock Central Time for all of our uh, Out of Illinois listeners. Uh, I have an idea. I think it's going to work. Okay. Uh, We're going to call it, I don't know, I got to think of a better second name. Hopefully by 2 o'clock I can come up with something better. Suggestions for Ben. (laughs) Right, I know it needs a little work. So, but it, it's a I, I cool could use idea. A lot of, I have a lot of suggestion needs. Oh well, yeah, yeah, we know that. But this will be about uh, movies. But uh, that's going to be coming okay. up at two o'clock. Love movies. Our second uh, ticket giveaway for Nick Offerman Sunday, September fifteenth at the Chicago Theater. All right, Mr. Jarofsky, mm-hmm. the polls are closed. Oh. The results are in. Okay. Does the Ben Jarofsky Show listening audience want to see as their Democratic nominee for president Elizabeth Warren? Uh-huh. Yay, nay, or meh? <laughs> That's the question we okay. asked all of you on both our Twitter and Facebook pages. Big thank you to everyone who reached out, and also thanks to those who left us your comments. Uh, comments like much older flower child on Twitter. Oh. Much like her comments she put. Wait, that's her name? Yeah, yeah. Oh, she, uh, much wait, no, older oh. flower child. That's her Twitter handle. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Come oh, on. you're hip. Oh, yeah. Much older flower <laughs> child on Twitter. Elizabeth okay. Warren for president. Yay, nay, meh. She put, right now, so far from voting, I'm not committed to anyone, but I wouldn't mind Elizabeth Warren. Like a lot of what she says, like her more and more, but need a final candidate that can win against the other. Don't feel confident she can. Mm. Well, I, I, you know, we all, I think every Democrat right now is just worried about that issue of electability. Or many, many Democrats. I wonder what Miles uh, has to say about this. The whole issue of electability, uh, it seems like a repeat in many ways of what went down in 2016, Bernie versus Hillary. But folks, the stakes are so high in terms of driving Donald Trump up from office and driving the Republicans out of office because this party um, has just uh, thrown away any credibility on being able to uh, address the problems facing our country. So I share her concern about electability, but I definitely like the presence of Elizabeth Warren in this campaign and the ideas she's raising. All right. How about KP Dawes on Twitter? KP Dawes reached out president or Elizabeth Warren for president in 2020. KP Dawes puts, if she runs against Trump, 
she'll lose if only because she's already been branded. We need a new generation in the executive. I think at Pete Buttigieg will surprise a lot of people this cycle. He's saying Buttigieg will surprise people, Ben. Uh, first of all, I give you credit for knowing how to pronounce the name. Did I do that right? Uh, I, I guess. Uh, Buttigieg, <laughs> he's the guy, he is the uh, mayor of South Bend, Indiana. Um, okay, as a person of the older persuasion, I'm a little less uh, jumping on that uh, millennial bandwagon that we need a younger person. I have this argument with millennials all the time. We need someone young, Ben. I'm like, all right, you know, but they, young doesn't automatically mean right. I was young once. Man, I was really stupid when I was young. But uh, uh, so, you know, I'm not quite certain. Uh, I would draw jump to the conclusion that Elizabeth Warren uh, cannot div, uh, beat Donald Trump simply because Donald Trump has slapped her with a nickname that's offensive. And so I think as the campaign would go on, the more Donald Trump slapped her with that nickname, the more it would undercut Donald Trump. So, uh, you know, I'm not, I haven't signed on to that argument yet. I don't think that just because he gives a nickname, if he gives a nickname to someone, it means that person with the nickname can't win. All right, moving along here. Oh, and uh, break the fourth wall. Uh, we have no uh, Miles, the editor today. I'm the guy getting the people, uh, our guests. So, Ben, oh. just let me know when uh, Miles is here or if he's here. And uh, we'll find a way to grab him and right, throw yeah. him in studio. Well, right? I'm a lot of miles, miles to go. I yeah. know, I know, right? Yeah. Our guest name's Miles, our editor's name's Miles. <laughs> but I uh, know, let me know if uh, when he's here. All right, here we go. Uh, Elizabeth Warren for president. Yay, nay, meh. DC Sampson posted. And this was a common response. If no Bernie Sanders, then yay. Yeah, I, I understand that response. A lot of Bernie lovers out there. And it could, this, deba uh, this election. Uh, this primary could come down to um, Bernie versus Elizabeth Warren. A lot of great ideas. I'll, I'll tell you what, I will welcome that debate. Okay, Bernie versus Elizabeth Warren, two smart people going at it and discussing issues. So, hey, man, let the debate begin. At Video Game Baselines. <laughs> come on, Twitter's man. awesome. <laughs> at Video Game Baselines yeah. agrees, posting Warren's my second behind Sanders. But I'd be 100% happy with her. Okay, 95%. All right, on to Facebook. Elizabeth Warren for president. John asks, uh, if there's a, uh, well, is there a over Beto sure option? That's what John puts. All right. All right, here's Alan's comment. What's going on, Alan? Alan puts, not his first choice, but still more credible than Beto. Oh, man, they're turning on Beto. Well, how, much, how many millions did Beto raise? Like seven like six or something? Million. Six, six million. Six million, million in okay. 24 hours. Wow. Our mm. good friend, well, none of those people are living in Chicago, apparently, or listening to the Ben Jarofsky <laughs> show. Our good friend yeah. and former guest. Guest Adolfo El Mondragon uh, weighed in. El Dragon. Adolfo puts Bernie. <laughs> he loves Bernie. Just Bernie and an exclamation mark. By the way, uh, Adolfo, uh, come on out and join us on election night. We uh, April second one. We'll be doing a remote uh, from a bar in Bridgeport. I'm going to reach out to you a little later on today. And finally, Michelle posted: uh, If Senator Warren does not win the nomination, I hope she gets picked for the Supreme Court. Wow, there's a thought. I always, well, that would, uh, of course, I, I, <laughs> that would require a Democrat to be the next uh, president of the United States. I always thought it would be good to have Barack Obama on the Supreme Court. How about that? That would be a good addition to the Supreme Court. He's a smart guy, constitutional scholar. So, but uh, anyway, um, yeah, Elizabeth Warren would be pretty good, too. All right, well, let's find out our poll results now. We'll read both Facebook and Twitter poll totals. Elizabeth Warren for president, yay, nay, or meh, the meh's on Twitter. Twitter only, by the way. Yeah, mm. thanks, Zuckerberg. I could put man on Facebook. <laughs> Zuckerberg. Good Lord. Uh, yeah, yeah. Can I get a man? That's all I need uh, is man. I can only do uh, yay or nay. Zuck says no, D. Uh, we did this exact poll last week on Twitter only after uh -huh. Beto O'Rourke announced his POTUS candidacy. And the nays won it at 47%. Let's see how Warren fares out. All right, here we go, people. First up, <laughs> our Twitter poll. <laughs> With a combined total of 343 votes on Twitter, Elizabeth Warren for president, yay, nay, or meh. In it third, it's nay. Yay. At 24%. Okay. Our second place poll Twitter poll answer. <laughs> this is confusing. <laughs> Our second place one, Elizabeth Warren for president. It's meh. Yeah. Okay. How much? 30%. All right. Meaning that, yes, the yays have it. Yay is the winner of our Twitter poll. 46% of 343 people. All right. So 46% say yes. 30% say meh. And how many said nay? 
24%. I would argue, and I think a compelling argument could be made, that our Twitter poll is more fair than the Electoral College. So let's just make her the president right now. Okay, oh, okay. great. Let's <laughs> All right, right, Donald, now. you're not the president anymore. Uh, the Ben Drowski <laughs> Show Twitter followers have weighed in. Beat it, all right? So once again, the yeas have it there. Uh, now on to the Facebook poll. Uh, good kiss to do you. Sorry. No, I that's okay. refrained the first time. But you do it this now, once again, Zuckerberg wouldn't let me uh, put <laughs> meh. What's suck? Seriously, man. Why? So okay. we got yay or nay, uh-huh. all right? Okay. Nevertheless, yeah, yeah. All right. with 127 <laughs> votes uh-huh. and for the win, yeah. with 53% on Facebook, uh-huh. Elizabeth Warren for president, yay, nay, or meh. <laughs> nay is our winner. Whoa. Nay. Whoa. At 53%. Wow. Yeah, with 47% of you hoping to see Elizabeth Warren for president well, in 2020. You see, now, this could be a situation, follow me in this, Steve, because they could not vote meh, they, meh voters went nay because nay was closer to meh than yay, if you follow that. I'm lost. <laughs> Either way, once again, Zuckerberg has affected the outcome of an election. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, yay, nay, man, the, the majority, yay wins on Twitter, nay wins on Facebook. Oh, you too, Facebook and Twitter. So there you are. And before we get out of here, let's do a quick 2019 Chicago Treasurer candidate update. This is a 2019 Chicago Treasurer Ooh, I love update. this song. By the way, I just want to report uh, that our next guest is here. And so when we're done with this, we'll let him in. All, All right. right, I'll make an extra long commercial here. Okay, so the following comes from WBEZ Chicago. WBEZ? Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, BEZ, yeah. they're by the, the Navy Pier. Oh, they sound way smarter was. than us. Yeah, yeah, yeah those smart guys. people. Uh, yeah. We're smart. <laughs> <laughs> a new campaign ad in yeah. Chicago's race for city treasurer oh, okay. is calling out Alderman Amaya Pawar mm. for his chronic absences at city council committee meetings. His opponent in the treasurer's race is one Melissa Conyers Irvin, and uh, she says uh, Pawar uh, chronic absences at city council meetings. Ben, your thoughts? Uh, well, I have that seen the study that shows, you know, what his absences are. So I'm just going to have to take her at a word which is always dangerous uh here in the city uh here in the city of chicago but uh, as i recall uh amaya was running for governor uh last year and he missed quite a few city council meetings as a result he was preoccupied you might say so i think it's a legitimate issue to raise um you know with uh who else got uh, there was a uh, cook county board commissioner uh, I can't remember the name right now who really was slammed by a Sun Times story, I think, on, on absentees. Oh, Bridget Gaynor, that was who it was. Uh, so, yeah, it's a legitimate issue to raise. Mm-hmm. If you're not going to show up to the meetings, I don't know. All right. um, if that's what's going to be the decisive vote for you folks, I don't know. may has got a lot of good ideas, on the other hand, about how uh, city government, sh- city money should be invested. So. You know, yes, more than one factor. There are other elections happening on April 2nd other than the mayor's race. It is the treasurer's race. 47th Ward, Alderman Amaya Pawar, and Illinois State Rep, correct? Melissa Conyers Irving. Mm-hmm. Here's the latest video from Conyers Irving on Amaya Pawar's uh, presence at the city meetings. Amaya Pawar is a typical politician. Pawar's missed more than half his meetings as alderman. One of the worst records in the city council. And when he did show up, Pawar voted for the largest property tax hike in Chicago history. But Melissa Conyers Irving shows up for us every day. Estate rep Melissa protected child care for Chicago families. Her plan will make the treasurer's office more independent from politicians and ensure we invest in every neighborhood, not just downtown. She's ready for this. Oh, you bet I am. Melissa Conyers Irving for treasurer. All right, listen. This is my advice to absolutely every voter in the, in the city of Chicago. When it comes not just to the treasurer's race, it goes to the mayor's race, it goes to automatic races, please try not to allow yourself to be uh, persuaded by a campaign commercial. You know, I, I know it's really hard. It really, I remember during the governor's race, for instance, so many voters come up, yeah, I like JB, they would tell me, because JB had that, JB uh, Pritzker, of course, when he was uh, running for governor, he had these commercials that made him seem like a real friendly guy, a real nice guy. He is a very, by the way, personable character. He's one of the most personable politicians I've seen in a long time come out, come out of Illinois. But, you know, this is mind manipulation, folks. Commercials, they're all intended to just kind of like... Uh, 
you know, take control of your mind and steer you in the direction that the, like, like getting you to buy a shoes that you don't need or getting you to buy, you know, uh, some food that you wouldn't ordinarily get, get you to feel hungry when you're not really hungry. You know, it's just mind manipulation. So, uh, you know, listen, it's a good point. As I said before, uh, Mayor Pawar's absences or his, uh, uh, his attendance rate in the city council, you know, as I said, he was running for governor at the same time. He was still serving uh, his term as uh, uh, alderman of the 47th Ward. So, um, you know, it's it's a legitimate issue. But I would be really cautious in general. This goes back to yesterday. We were talking about the very funny, cute commercial that Lori Lightfoot did, uh, which included her daughter and introduced the concept of the dance flossing, which I did not know about flossing until I saw the commercial. So it was a big day for oh, me. I just Dave. got in here flossing. Oh, I know you don't yeah, floss. I'm I like, don't. Oh, the dance. <laughs> the dance. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the floss dance, which I uh, have since pointed out, and many people must agree, is really just, you know, an update on the twist. Okay? <laughs> the tw- floss is just the twist. I had this discussion with my wife last night. Uh, what you know? There's really not much a difference between a floss and a twist. All right. That's great. Mayor's uh, mayor's discussion at the dinner table. <laughs> oh no! Oh no! Flossing and twisting. Anyway, so commercials are mind manipulation, folks. Don't fall for them. You might laugh at them. You may think it's cute. You may enjoy uh, watching uh, Lori Lightfoot's daughter parade around the house uh, blowing the trumpet. But if that's why you vote for mayor, well, you get a D minus in citizenship. <laughs> All, All right. right, there you are, everybody. Just like that, you're now in the know of what's going on in Chicago. And you now know that the Ben Jarofsky Show listening audience, uh, I don't know, the yay and nay. I don't know, I guess you don't really have too much of a result there for Elizabeth Warren for president. Well, I think it's a strong result for Elizabeth Warren when you add it all together. And when you consider that uh, Zuckerberg wouldn't let us vote yeah, uh, neutral. Damn Zuckerberg. <laughs> Blame it on Facebook again, all yeah. right? But now you'll have an answer the next time someone asks you, hey, what else is news? All right, let me tell you something. Something that Nick Offerman thinks. Something that Nick Spazzato, our guest uh, coming up in the 2 o'clock hour, thinks. Okay. And something that Nick Roberson, a kid that played on my uh, junior high basketball team, all agree. You did a great job. Give yourself a raise. Take it out of petty cash. We have Miles Conflassen from In These Times He's in the here. studio. We're going to take a break and come right back. Hey there, producer Dennis here. Thanks for finding and listening to the brand new Ben Jarofsky Show. All right, so here's how this works. The Ben Jarofsky Show live streams on the Chicago Sun-Times YouTube channel Tuesday through Friday, 1 until 3 p.m. Once the show is over, you can listen to the replay on our YouTube channel, or we throw it online for you to download by 4 p.m. Where can you download the Ben Jarofsky Show, you may be asking yourself? Well, you may be asking yourself a fantastic question, you can find previous Ben Jarofsky shows and guest interviews through several outlets. The Chicago Sun-Times Online, chicago.suntimes.com. The Chicago Reader Online, chicagoreader.com. And wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts. Apple Podcasts, Google Play, pick one. Just search for The Ben Jarofsky Show. J-O-R-A. V is in victory, S-K-Y. So, let's recap. Tuesday through Friday, 1 until 3 p.m., live streamed on the Chicago Sun-Times YouTube channel and downloadable by 4 at chicago.suntimes.com, chicagoreader.com, and wherever else you listen to your favorite podcast. Yes, the Ben Jarofsky Show is back. We're live and downloaded. Tell your friends and enjoy the rest of the show. Welcome back to the Ben Jarofsky Show, live from the Chicago Sun-Times. Yes, indeed, we are live from the Chicago Sun-Times. Mile Comp Lassen, uh, political reporter and editor for In These Times in the studio, all-around political geek and junkie. Miles, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Ben. And, uh, yeah, you were on my show the last show I had. Now you're back. What a lovely little studio, huh, Love man? It. it feels like an upgrade. Yeah, <laughs> it is an upgrade in many ways, in many, many ways. All right, before we take the deep dive on the local issues, uh, I know you've been following very closely the mayor's race and a lot of the aldermanic races. I need to get your opinion. Uh, uh, we're already, I'm already looking forward to the uh, Democratic primaries. Oh, man, this summer is going to be wild, Miles. Uh, but we did these. Uh, we had some fun. We did a, a couple Twitter polls regarding uh, Elizabeth Warren and uh, Beto O'Rourke. 
uh, our followers say 46% want Elizabeth Warren uh, to be the next president, 24% say no, and 30% are like, meh, you know, they, uh, they haven't made up their minds yet. Uh, so 46 yes, 24 no, 30%, uh, they haven't made up their minds. What's your take on all this? Well, I think uh, I actually saw somebody recently refer to Elizabeth Warren as kind of the Lisa Simpson candidate in this uh, in this race. I don't know if that's meant as a compliment or a well, that's a wait, <laughs> a wait, wait. Bit, okay, yeah. Lisa Simpson, of course, the real smart kid in the Simpsons. Exactly. They're, they're Who doesn't getting always it. get all the credit. She's not always you know the uh, front of the class or anything like that. But she's back there doing the doing the hard work. Wow, that's good, uh, man. A, I like that. Of course, what I would say is that you know this has really been an incredible. Uh, primary race so far. We're early days yet, but we've got, you know, over a dozen candidates uh, announced. And what's amazed me is the depth and um, boldness of the policies that have been proposed by these candidates. And Elizabeth Warren is um, right there with the best of them in terms of her expansive platform when it comes to universal child care. She put out a pretty incredible um, plat- uh, plan around universal child care, which would dramatically change the way the United States provides um, child care, and we really are one of the very few countries, developed countries in the world that doesn't have guaranteed parental leave. We don't have guaranteed child care, mm-hmm. and she wants to change that. She wants to uh, do a wealth tax on the richest, which would be, you know, it seems like a small tax, but it would raise a massive amount of revenue. Uh, and she's running as a populist, which is interesting because as a lot of people would say, she was a Republican for most of her life. You know, she's from Oklahoma. She doesn't have the same type of fiery uh, uh, populist background mm-hmm. as somebody like Bernie Sanders, who's been, you know, in the socialist movement for most of his life, been involved in a lot of left wing organizations. But she's been going hard against the bankers and against um, the big uh, pharmaceutical companies, the insurance companies for uh, decades now. And she's made a lot of enemies. And I think that's a good sign. So, um, I think she's made the right kind of enemies uh, to, to say. So I, I'm happy to see that she's right there up there with uh, with other Now, candidates. let me ask you, I know I don't want to spend too much time doing this, although I can't stop myself sometimes, Miles, uh, when we start talking, going down certain uh, political avenues. But uh, instinctively, when I uh, immediately, when I hear Elizabeth Warren's name, um, I think of uh, Donald Trump's nickname against her and the, uh, the way uh, she handled the whole issue of whether she is... Uh, Native American or not Native American, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, already some of our Twitter followers are weighing in. They're saying, well, she can't be elected because of that. All right, yeah. that argument. Uh, what's your opin- uh, opinion about that? Well, I, I think she handled that pretty poorly. I, I got to say that was a weird rollout of her trying to reclaim Native American identity when I think a lot of people in tribal communities took that as offense because, you know, they're when it comes down to, you know, tracing blood quantum or something, that's not the way that you always identify. And certainly with her background, it seems like she potentially used that to get some legs up in her admissions and different um, colleges and things. And that's, you know, it doesn't, it's not a good look for her, I don't think, when she's trying to reach out. That said, I think she's doing a lot of work to try to become a racially justice focused candidate. You know, she's speaking out about reparations now. She's talking more about um, a lot of different issues that other candidates in the race haven't been talking about. So I think that's a positive thing. I think that will, (laughs) it's, I don't think you're the only one who instantly thinks of the, you know, uh, kind of racist Pocahontas term that Donald Trump has linked her to. And I can't imagine that will help her. I think the other (laughs) thing that people think of when Donald Trump uh, talks about Democratic candidates as crazy Bernie is what he calls calls Bernie. For Bernie, I think that that's he's embracing that a little bit more as, yeah. you know, this kind of Larry David like character yeah. who's just rambling on about the billionaire class. But you know what? He's been doing that for uh, for many, many decades yeah. now. So it kind of fits him. <laughs> I think Trump's new one for Bernie is the nutty professor. Okay. And uh, but listen, I don't think Democrats should be live in fear of the nicknames that Donald Trump comes up with for them, you know, at some point, I think like Bernie's embraces it, yeah. uh, or you counterattack it like yeah. Elizabeth Warren has. But the yeah. notion that, you know, Trump, <laughs> that Democrats should live in fear because of Donald Trump's tweets, uh, yeah. well, it's self-defeating to begin with. Well, I think they've got to go on the offense. I think that that's the, going to be the key to this election. And that's why you're seeing the, the center of gravity in the party is not only on the left, but it's with the kind of grassroots movement demands that have been um, shaping the this, the landscape of this primary now. I, I have never seen candidates rush towards 
policies like Medicare for all or jobs guarantee, things that would have been unthinkable in 2016 or 2012 or 2008 for that matter. And I think it's due to the dedicated work of social movements and grassroots groups that have been demanding this stuff and putting it forward. And now they have people that want to be seen as the left candidate because that's where the energy is. So they're rushing to embrace it. And that is the kind of uh, leadership I think people want to see. It's not just defending themselves against Trump and his tweets, but it's putting forward an actual plan that will make people's lives better. We've seen that uh, transition to the left, that movement to the left uh, locally as well. We're going to shift gears here and talk about the mayor's race, but we saw in the governor's race, all the Democratic candidates for governor. So a year ago today, I think it was that the election was amazing. That primary wow. is already a year has gone by. All the uh, candidates for governor ran as progressives, sure. uh, of the leading candidates anyway. And we're seeing that uh, in this current race for mayor, uh, both candidates, uh, Tony Preckwinkle and Lori Lightfoot, want to be known as progressives, which is an interesting change uh, for the city of Chicago. You, that must encourage you, not? Yeah, well, certainly. The, the, there's no doubt that we're going to see a change from the Rahm Emanuel style of governance um, in in the next with the next mayor in office. And both of them are, since the runoff began, both of them are running to occupy that left lane in the race and see who's, you know, who's more progressive than who. I think the proof will be in the pudding in terms of what they do once they're in office. I mean, the challenges facing the next mayor are pretty monumental when you look at the financial um, crises that the city is in right now with the pension payments that are going to come due and the amount of debt that the city is in and the way we need to fix so many deep-seated problems when it comes to endemic poverty, segregation, you know, the lack of fully funded public schools. So it's going to be a challenge for whoever is occupying that office. And what is going to make the difference is the type of social forces behind the movements on the ground that are pushing them and who's who are they going to be um, accountable to. Everybody can run on a progressive mantle in a campaign, but how do they govern? All right. And, that's the biggest question mark because we haven't seen one of the candidates has never held elected office before. Uh, you mentioned we're going to uh, see a change in the Rahm Emanuel style of governance, uh, no matter who gets elected. Uh, talk about that a little bit. What do you mean by that? Well, for example, when, um, as you well know, you and your um, colleague McDumkey did some work on getting Rahm's records of who he was meeting with, mm -hmm. and we saw who he was meeting with, and it was not community groups. It was not... Uh, residents of the city, it was wealthy business people almost all the time. That was his real constituency, the people he met with, the people he counseled with, and the people that helped, I think, guide the direction of the city under his uh, mayorship. I don't think that either of these candidates are going to operate in that same way. And I also don't think they'll necessarily look towards the same solutions that he immediately looked for, which were things like privatization deals or public-private partnerships, um, kind of creative ways that uh, to get out of city problems without relying on building up the public sector. I mean, what Emanuel ran on um, was more cops and also uh, cutting government, essentially. It was like an austerity regime. And once he got into office, he did that. He cut public sector union jobs. He raised regressive taxes and fines and fees and approached the government like a corporate uh, CEO would approach a business, you know, yeah. cut the fat. And uh, I don't think we're going to see that in the same way, partially because of the amount of resistance to that style of governance we saw. That's a good uh, point. I'd just years. like to make one uh, point. Uh, when he did run in 2011, he said he was going to uh, hire a thousand more police officers and he was going to use TIF dollars to, uh, to hire them. It was one of the first promises he broke, Miles. He did not hire the 1,000 more yeah. police officers, and he definitely did use TIF dollars to bolster the operational sides of government. He continued the process of spending them on big-time mega deals like yeah. the Lincoln Yards deals uh, coming down the pike. So I just heard that will be the biggest TIF deal ever. If that goes through. Uh, the uh, biggest private, yes, yeah. it will be. And then, uh, yeah, it'll be $1.3 billion. And there's going to be a vote in mid-April on that one, folks. It's not completely a done deal yet. It's going to be a vote. Of course, that will be a lame duck session. So, I mean, that's the thing is these people are not going to have anything to lose. Well, here's, uh, now it's, you raise an interesting point, Miles, because I, I put to both candidates. Both candidates are on record as saying they're against uh, that Lincoln Yards TIF yeah. deal, all right? They're on record as saying that. On the other hand, uh, if they let things go their way, it'll pass before they take office, and they could say, well, there's nothing I can do about it, and that way they don't offend uh, the people who support it, and they could just go on 
they can then be the one who clip the ribbons and get the credit for it, et cetera, et cetera, without having to take a stand. Do you think uh, that either there's a, when you take a look at either candidate, do you see either candidate, anything in their past that would give you um, confidence that one might be more forceful than the other uh, in that lame duck session? In other words, the mayoral elect, if let's say it's the mayoral elect Preckwinkle, as opposed to mayoral elect uh, Lightfoot, one more or the other more forceful in demanding or asking the city council to defer that matter? Well, the one candidate we've seen that was actually had a record doing this is Tony Preckwinkle in terms of, you know, legislating and being able to kind of wrangle votes one way or another. Lightfoot, we haven't seen that from just because she hasn't been in office before. I was slightly encouraged uh, with her appearance on um, your show the other week where she talked about the doling out of the money, you know, that this is going to come in different amounts. If the city is giving away TIF money, it's not all going to be in one lump sum. So we might be able to then reassess these deals. Mm -hmm. I think that that is a good point. Um, that said, I don't know how committed she will be to that, nor do I know how committed Preckwinkle will be. But I do know that the types of organizations that are backing uh, Preckwinkle do not want to see us invest TIF money into a giant glitzy second downtown on the riverfront. So I think they'll have more of a role in trying to force her hand if she becomes the next mayor. These are groups like the Chicago Teachers Union, for example, that has long fought for TIF money to be redistributed into the schools. I think they will put a lot of pressure on a mayor-elect Preckwinkle to um, come out strongly against Lincoln Yard's throughout the campaign and afterwards. Miles Kampflassen from In These Times, political reporter and editor from In These Times is my guest. We're talking, uh, we're now talking about the mayoral election. Uh, the Chicago Sun-Times, in whose building uh, you are currently sitting. Uh, it's a really nice building. Yeah, it's a nice building and a lovely little studio, as I like to point out. Uh, they've endorsed uh, Lori Lightfoot. They uh, reaffirmed their endorsement today. I don't know if you get an opportunity to read it, but of uh, a very forceful editorial uh, uh uh, siding with uh, Lori Lightfoot. I have some issues with the editorial. I'm going to reach out to Tom Mack and me to come on and talk about him tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a good friend of the show. But um, one of the points uh, uh, that uh, the editorial made is an interesting one. I'd love to share it with you. Uh, and it was essentially talking about how both candidates are trying to position themselves as the more progressive candidate. He made the same observation that both yeah. you and I have made. But he went one step further and said... Um, uh, well, he, I don't, I'm assuming Tommy wrote it. I don't know who wrote it. The editorial writer wrote it. Uh, uh, the, they wrote um, that that's not necessarily a good thing uh, to, to be in the city of Chicago and suggesting, of course, that voters in various parts of the city would be turned off or alienated uh, by the progressive label. What's your sense about where Chicago is? You've lived, you grew up here, you went to a public school here in the city of Chicago. You are a Chicagoan for better or for worse. What's your sense, Miles, of how Chicagoans view themselves politically? Well, I don't think, uh, Chicagoans I don't think are big on labels and big on defining themselves through a left-right spectrum or even necessarily progressive or conservative. I mean, the everyone might call themselves a Democrat, but that there, that could mean a lot of different things in a city like Chicago. And I think we've seen that through um, Rahm Emanuel, through how he is operated, which is on level with how we would see Republicans operating in other parts of the country where there was not one party rule in the city. That said, I think Chicagoans want to see basic uh, functions of government serve them that are not serving them right now. And they want to see their property taxes not be going through the roof. They want to see uh, their schools get funded. They want to see opportunity. That means investing in communities that have been uh, drained of resources for decades, that have suffered from the legacy of redlining and racist mortgage loans. They want to see the you know there not be any more food deserts for things to be more equally distributed. Whether you call that progressive or not, I think that that's what the majority of uh, people in the city of Chicago want to get behind, and they want to see a platform and put forward by a candidate that would actually accomplish those things. And that's what I think is the real core of this race. It's not who says they're most progressive or not. It's uh, who's going to fulfill those functions of government. My guest right now is Miles Kampflassen from In These Times. My next guest is in the studio as well. We're going to let him settle in the great Nick Spazzato, Alderman of the 38th.
Mm-hmm. Nick is laughing. We go way, way back. Nick Spazato and Ben Jarofsky. We're going to have fun talking to Nick Spazato, and I think Miles will be gracious enough to stick around uh, as well. Before I bring Nick on, Miles, let's continue this a little bit. Um, the notion of Chicago as uh, sort of pragmatic city, a different sure. key. Uh, we're maybe not progressive, but pragmatic. Uh, and we look, this, I'm, I'm t- interpreting what you said, putting the best spin possibly for the voters of the city of Chicago. I've often been hard on the voters of the city of Chicago. In a lot of my- well, I got to say real quick, yeah. I, what I think the, the specter of this election for the longest time was fulfilling the Ben Jarofsky prophecy that the, the Chicago voters are <laughs> fools and will go with a daily whenever he's on the ballot. Yeah, that is true. And, I've been known to say that. Spazzato's <laughs> laughing over there. Yeah. We saw, yeah. We, we, and we saw a different way this time, you know? So... Yeah. All right, Miles. They might have proved you wrong for once. All right, hold on. Turnout gotta, wasn't great, but. I have to say this. I'm going to make this concession to the Chicago voters. All right. Uh, Miles, Dennis, uh, and Nick Spazzato. You guys prove me wrong out there, okay? <laughs> I thought that a Chicago voter would see that name daily and just that hand. I know they could not go to any other. Oh, they punched daily. Of course, now it was Billy Daly. All right, mm-hmm. nobody knew who he was. Here I am backing away from giving him credit already, Miles. So maybe they didn't know he was a daily, you know what I'm saying? I, there's always that possibility. It's possible, <laughs> but I mean, I, yeah. you know, what it comes down to, I think a lot of people are, are worried because they think, oh, it would have been daily if not Jerry Joyce in the election. And, you know, Jerry Joyce got tons of support down in Beverly. Well, well let me ask you about that. I'm going to ask Nick Spazzato about that when he comes on in a little bit. Uh, the art, there's been an argument made that Jerry Joyce, uh, his presence on the ballot, and you're from Beverly, you're a Beverly kid, aren't you? Uh, you're a 19th Ward kid. Uh, that uh, Jerry Joyce's presence on the ballot uh, kept Bill Daly out of the runoff. That effectively the Joyce's undercut the Daly's. Uh, and so maybe I shouldn't give credit to the uh, enlightened Chicago voters. Maybe I should just give all the credit to Jerry Joyce. What's your thought about that? Well, you could always make the argument that one candidate's splitting votes from the other one. You could easily say Daly kept the Joyce voters, you know, from voting for, for Jerry Joyce, and that would have changed the dynamics of the election, too. You never know. I mean, there were so many candidates running this time. Everyone was taking votes from everybody else, and so that's why the runoff is going to be so interesting, because none, of, neither of these candidates got a majority of votes. Most They were getting, what, 12, 13 percent of the electorate out of the third of registered voters who actually showed up to the polls. So the, uh, the you know runoff election, I think, is really going to show where each candidate has support. And there was a story out today showing that, you know, Lori Lightfoot is gaining this uh, new kind of constituency linking lakefront liberals to the um, south and uh, northwest sides, these more law and order focused areas of the city. Uh, as you had mentioned before, I think that's maybe similar to Ron Manuel's uh, constituency as well. So I don't know if that's a completely new coalition, but I think that's very different from the type of voters that Tony Preckwinkle has been trying to reach out to. Well, I would argue that uh, those are the voters who elected Tony Preckwinkle in the first place. I'm old enough to remember Tony Preckwinkle's first uh, significant victory, 2010, when she defeated uh, was it Todd Stroger? Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see if I can go. There were a lot of candidates. I'm looking at Spazzato. He doesn't know the candidate. He can't remember him either. What was the gentleman's name? Oh, boy, the Irish guy that ran. O'Brien. Yeah, Terry O'Brien. Spazzato knows his stuff. Mm-hmm. Terry O'Brien. And that one, that was a, a, a defy, that defied all logic, uh, Miles, because the, the conventional wisdom, follow me on this, coming into that election was that uh, if you had more than one black candidate on the race against one white guy, the black vote would uh, divide itself up. All the white votes would go to the white guy, the white guy would win. That was the conventional wisdom coming out of the 83 uh, mayoral election, 87 mayoral election. What happened in 2010 was that Tony Preckwinkle picked up most of the white vote, including on the Northwest side where Nick Spazzato's from, and that enabled her to defeat Terry O'Brien it, that's his base, O'Brien's base on the northwest side. So I, in many ways, Tony Preckwinkle, I would argue, was the person who really forged that alliance. I think it was Chicago Magazine. Some kid yeah. from Chicago Magazine wrote that. Um, that, that, that Tony Preckwinkle forged uh, that alliance, and that has catapulted her to the position she mm-hmm. is in, and maybe that um, constituency is, is abandoning her now yeah. uh, because she got too close to Joe Berrios. Exactly. Well, and as... 
as I've said, I think that this is the the election really became more of a referendum on corruption than people were expecting when things started out. I mean, when the, uh, initially when even Lightfoot and McCarthy had announced Rahm Emanuel was still in the race, and I think people assumed this was going to be a referendum on Rahm's mayorship and Laquan McDonald and the um, you know various financial crises facing the city, and instead it became about Ed Burke and Danny Solis and wires and the FBI and. Um, you know, Lori's uh, campaign slogan has been spotlights coming out of a star since day one. And people saw that and said, hey, this is a candidate who wants to undo the machine and all the corruption and everything like that. And Tony Preckwinkle got painted as a as the machine candidate. I don't know if that's necessarily reflective of their actual positions and policies, but I think that's ultimately the dynamic that formed, and that's why we see the kind of lopsided poll numbers we're seeing now. I, I agree with you completely, and that is definitely the theme of the Sun-Times editorial that I alluded to already, which is reaffirming its support uh, for uh, Lori Lightfoot. All right, uh, Miles comp uh from In These Times is my guest. Uh, Nick Spazato, as I said before, is in the studio already. We're going to bring him on after this break. Miles has been so kind as to stick around, and we'll continue our political talk, because folks, we love talking politics on the Ben Jarofsky Show. We'll be right back. The Ben Jarofsky Show is brought to you by the Chicago Sun-Times. For the latest in Chicago and Illinois news, sports, weather, and the latest in national news from a real Chicago frame of mind and real Chicago writers, check out the Chicago Sun-Times. Read the daily paper or online at chicago.suntimes.com. And hey, if you have a little extra cash, subscribe and by the Chicago Reader. For a deeper dive in the daily Chicago news and for all of what's going on in this city, you gotta read the Reader. Music, arts and culture, film, extensive event calendars, concert listings, and more, including weekly political columns from writers like Maya Dukmasova and, yes, our very own Ben Jarofsky. The Chicago Reader is free in newsstands and at chicagoreader.com. That's chicagoreader.com. Hey there, producer Dennis here. Thanks for finding and listening to the brand new Ben Jarofsky Show. All right, so here's how this works. The Ben Jarofsky Show live streams on the Chicago Sun-Times YouTube channel Tuesday through Friday, 1 until 3 p.m. Once the show is over, you can listen to the replay on our YouTube channel or we throw it online for you to download by 4 p.m. Where can you download the Ben Jarofsky Show, you may be asking yourself? Well, you may be asking yourself a fantastic question, you can find previous Ben Jarofsky shows and guest interviews through several outlets. The Chicago Sun-Times Online, chicago.suntimes.com. The Chicago Reader Online, chicagoreader.com. And wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts. Apple Podcasts, Google Play, pick one. Just search for The Ben Jarofsky Show. J-O-R-A. V as in victory, S-K-Y. So, let's recap. Tuesday through Friday, 1 until 3 p.m., live streamed on the Chicago Sun-Times YouTube channel and downloadable by 4 at chicago.suntimes.com, chicagoreader.com, and wherever else you listen to your favorite podcast. Yes, the Ben Jarofsky Show is back. We're live and downloaded. Tell your friends and enjoy the rest of the show. All right, everybody, hour number two of your Ben Jarofsky show for Wednesday, March 20th is moments away. But before we go any further here, we would like to thank the following unions for sponsoring this program. The International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, Local 126 and District 8, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 9, and the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 150. Thank you once again to those unions for jumping on board with us. And of course, Today's show is brought to you by our friends at the Chicago Federation of Labor. Hour number two, let's go. Yes, it is Wednesday, March 20th, and live from the Chicago Reader's Suntime Studios on Racine Avenue, this is the Ben Jarofsky Show. 
in this hour of the program. We still got In These Times writer Miles Complassen with us, and we welcome 38th Ward Alderman, Nick Spazzato. Got to make him wait a little, you know? And now your host, Chicago Reader columnist, Benny J. Benjirovsky. Yes, indeed. Miles Complassen has been... Uh, Nice enough to stick around, uh, and he'll be joining us more in the conversation as the uh, hour goes on. Uh, Nick Spazzato is in the studio, uh, 38th Ward Alderman Nick Spazzato. And, uh, Form- formerly 36th Ward Alderman, so I like that. Ed, so. th- that is correct, formerly a 36th Ward Alderman. We'll get into the whole history of Nick Spazzato and the 36th Ward, the 38th Ward, and our relationship. But before we do that, D, you got an update? Absolutely, I do. It is our second Nick Offerman Chicago Theater ticket giveaway. It's going to be happening here uh, at the end of... Actually, we're going to keep this open for 24 hours, all right? Okay. And Ben, it's called... I couldn't think of a better name. Suggestions for Ben. That's, <laughs> okay, that's yeah, it. Suggestions for Ben. I need a lot of help. Yeah, well, we know that, but this is about <laughs> movies. Uh, so, if you want tickets to see Nick Offerman... The guy from Parks and Rec, Ron Swanson, Sunday, September 15th at the Chicago Theater. You got to give a suggestion to Ben. And since Ben Jarofsky is an avid watcher of movies, guys, he talks about movies all the time to annoyance almost. <laughs> baby, you had a big Baby Driver face. Oh, there man. I love You see Baby Driver, Nick? Do you see it? I see it. Uh, oh, it's, whoa, <laughs> whoa. Something just <laughs> fell. Baby <laughs> Driver just today. crashed. Yeah. The driver, <laughs> it's a great movie, Baby Driver. Thank one of my you. favorite movies of last year. Oh, yeah, my on-air sign yeah. fell down. <laughs> All right. He loves Baby Driver. Get Out. He wouldn't stop talking oh, about Get that. Get Out. I love Get Out. So, By the way, he's got a new movie coming out. Oh, oh yeah. Jordan yeah. Peele, uh-huh. man. Yeah, so right. we are waiting for the next uh, movie to Ben Jarofsky to talk to us in annoyance to. So. <laughs> What It'll probably movie, be Jordan Peele's movie. What movie should Ben watch next on Netflix? Ooh. All right, that's the suggestion for Ben. Now, Ben's a little old school, all right? Yeah. He gets his uh, Netflix movies mailed to him. <laughs> it's no, true. it's not 2004, people. Ben Drowski just really likes it. Uh, so yeah. it's going to turn Sunday, September 15th at the Chicago Theater. So head over to Facebook, at Benny J Show. Twitter, at Benny J Show as well. Leave us your suggestions what movie should ben watch next and have mailed to him on netflix so head over to the pages and send your suggestions all right let me just uh, give him a little help when you're making your suggestions as to what movie i should watch next and folks i do love movies everybody knows that i love them love oh, them he's love helping them. you out guys I, listen these... I, I watch three movies a week at least nick Spazzato, at least all right so before you give me your suggestions i should warn you the last movie i saw two days ago i saw it for the second time the other guys you ever see the other guys i love the other guys nope. yeah you see that miles nope. okay never even heard of it uh, it's with uh mark Wahlberg and will Farrell. It's a comedy about two cops in New York City. I just, I don't know. I love that movie. I saw it when it first came out. But actually, Miles, the, it, it's not just a cop comedy. It's made by Adam McKay, who is the oh, same yeah. director who did Vice. And it has, at the very end, uh, the, the closing credits, uh, a really ringing denunciation of, of corporate thievery mm-hmm. and inequity. You would think a cop, a buddy flick, a comedy with Will Ferrell and Mark Wahlberg would be decidedly non-political, but it had this political twist to it at the end. So I urge everybody, if you if you like comedies, to watch that one. Anyway, don't recommend other guys uh, because I already just saw it. All right. All right. So don't recommend other guys, guys. We'll we'll uh, read some of your suggestions hopefully a little later on. All right, very good. I'm going to turn my attention to the alderman from the 38th Ward, Nick Spasato. And yes, indeed, Nick, when I first met you, the year you just uh, reminded me was 2007. Let's go back in the time capsule. 2007, that's 12 years ago. It was right after the mayoral automatic election of 2007 when the city of Chicago, in its infinite wisdom, in quotes, decided to reelect Richie M. Daly again. All right, that's back when the city had that daily thing going, Nick Spazzato. They could not help themselves. You convened a gathering of aldermanic wannabes, I'll say. People political wannabes. Yeah, yeah there was some aldermen, some you know, state rep senators. There was about fifteen of us, if I remember correctly. And and, and we had three people end up being aldermen in the in the two thousand eleven election. So and that was Kappelman, uh, Michelle Smith and myself. So Wow, the three of them, and, and how did you, okay, so you gathered them, and it was at a pizza parlor, as I went, or pizza restaurant yeah, on the pizza Northwest restaurant, side? Yeah, I, just, I picked the place, and actually, I was never even there before, but I, I saw a good location, easy for people to get, and I just cold call a bunch of people, and everybody came, and we just kind of brainstormed and shared ideas, and we had about maybe three meetings, and then it kind of just pooped out, and 
you know, it would never much materialized after 2008, so. Well, uh, I was asked to come to talk about you TIFFs. Are our first speaker. Yes, yes. <laughs> TIFFs, what else? In 2007, folks, I was still obsessed. I was already obsessed, I should say. Uh, and the argument I gave to the aldermen, that, or the wannabe aldermen, and the wannabe state reps, the wannabe poly- elected officials, who, these were people who had not been elected yet, but were going to be challenging the quote unquote machine candidates. The argument I gave, the issue I told them, the, the issue they should uh, run on was to uh, take a stand against the TIF program, the way it was operated in the city of Chicago, that that would get you elected and um, the people of your district would appreciate you for doing that. In retrospect, do you think I was naive to give all you political wannabes that advice? Uh, no, I mean, I thought it was good advice. I mean, it, it, it wasn't the platform I ran on when I ran in, in 2011, but for some areas, you know, I'm guessing it would work well. Certainly, uh, um, you know, sometimes it's hard to argue with, with TIFF because see what it, what it did to the South Loop and the West Loop. So I know the idea of it is the, the, to build up impoverished areas and the West Loop and the South Loop, you know, 20 years ago was not that great and look at it now, so. Well, it, if you pour pour money into, so the argument is if you pour money into a, a neighborhood uh, that's already gentrifying, then you can accelerate the gentrification. So the South Loop has been, uh, the seeds of gentrification been occurring in the South Loop since the 80s, Nick, since I moved to the city of Chicago. Uh, so, all right, before we have another TIFF argument, uh, let's talk about your first run was uh, in, uh, 2011, you ran in the 36th well, 2007 war. was my first run. Oh my God, that's right, you had just I lost. I kind of got my brains beat in, uh, I got 24% of the vote, and then I came back uh, four years later and kind of beat their brains. All in, right, so. talk about that, the 36th ward. Uh, the first one or the second one? A the seven. second one, let's talk uh, about that. The second this. one, well, I just, as you know, I was gearing up from a seven. My, my plan when I ran in seven was, I knew it would be uh, very difficult to beat the incumbent, but I was looking to let people know I'm serious about this and make a good showing. I thought I could, I thought I would do much better than I did. I thought I could get a, actually a third to 40% of the vote, and then I thought I could build off of that. That didn't quite happen. I got a little less than 25% of the vote, but still I, I continued to stay active in my community and, and doing what I was doing, and then I, uh, I got a big break when, uh, when the current alderman stepped down and handed the uh, alderman job off to somebody else, and um, it was kind of an easy target. And um, All right, what Nick's leaving out of the story is that the current alderman who stepped out was a guy named Banks from the all-powerful Banks family in the 36th Ward, very connected family in the city of Chicago, particularly in the northwest side. So it's Pizzotto. Uh, no matter what you think about him now, people, uh, was a very it was an act of courage to run against the Banks family back in uh, 2007 and 2011. I have, gave you credit for it. And inviting somebody like me up to the northwest side uh, to talk to your group. Uh, so I give you credit uh, for that. You When Bill Banks stepped down, he was the zoning chair, as you recall, the chairman of the zoning committee Correct. before Danny Solis got that gig. Uh, when he stepped down, he his uh, driver, John Rice, wasn't it the driver? That's what he referred to him as all the time was his driver, yes. Yeah, they put him up and uh, Nick Spazzato defeated. Uh, well, they, they didn't really put him up, I mean, Daly gave him the job when Banks stepped down, and then, of course, he had to run two years later, and he ran against me, and I, I believe there were six people in the race, so, right. and then, we got a, our goal was we all were working together, the five of us, and we said anybody who gets in a runoff will back that person. And sure enough, I was uh, fortunate enough to be in a runoff, and everybody got behind me, and um, we did pretty well in the runoffs. So. All right, you were a city fighter fighter at a city fire firefighter. First time. firefighter ever elected to the city council. We now have three. There are three firefighters in the now city. Now there is three. There's Napolitano and Gardner. Yes. Oh, that's right. Gardner just got elected. But, in, uh, well, he's all, all, um, uh, automatic elect. Uh, he's not. He hasn't right. been sworn in yet. All right. Uh, so. I mistakenly would label you as a liberal uh, because you invited someone like me to come to talk to your group. And you always correct me when I go, Nick Spazzato is a liberal. So is Nick Spazzato a liberal? Or no. have you ever been a liberal? No, I was never a liberal. No, I mean, I, I no, I was never a liberal. I was, I was always pretty conservative. So pretty conservative social views mainly. So Now, uh, have you abandoned any of your conservative social views? Uh, no, I actually, they're, they're probably getting stronger now because I, I just think the Dems are out of control. I, and I still consider myself a Dem. I've never, ever pulled a Republican ballot. I've always pulled a Democratic ballot. Uh, but just the Dems just keep frustrating me more and more. And, and listen, most of my friends are like me. They're totally frustrated with the Democratic Party. They've gone too far to the left. Not that the not the Republicans are perfect either, uh, going a little too far to the right maybe. But uh, yeah, the Dems just, uh, if, if they're just, they're, you know, they're, they're off. They're off 
they're off the United States. They're into the ocean right Nick, now. So. How can two people disagree so much on so issue like you mean? I think the Dems have moved too far to the right. Oh, That's wow. the problem with the Democratic Ooh. Party. In fact, let's go back to 2016. Uh, let's. You're, I'm going to give you truth serum. All right. So you have to answer this question honestly. Did you vote for Donald John Trump for president in 2016, Nick Spazzato? Yes, I did, but I, I technically I didn't vote for him. I voted against Hillary. Hillary was toxic. I didn't like her. I thought she was a bad person. My wife felt the same way. My daughters, my mother, we, we all did not like that individual. So uh, tech, my technicality is I voted against Hillary, but yes, I did vote okay, for Donald Trump. There's no such thing as a technicality in an election, well, I mean, young man. I, you, know, if, <laughs> you if voted there, for Trump. If there was a decent uh, Democratic candidate, I probably would have voted for him. I mean, had Joe Biden been in, maybe he would have been my vote. I, I mean, I don't know. But, now, yeah. what, dis, I mean, let's just pause for a moment. There's no discernible distinction between Joe Biden and Hillary Clinton on any issues that would motivate you one way or the other. They they see this. They're pretty much the same on every single issue across the board. So why would you vote for one or Pro the other? Probably the trustworthy thing. I mean, some people just have that aura about them and just untrustworthy, not real. I mean, fake people. So um, you know. So I mean, that was the main reason. She just was. Just didn't seem to be a nice, not a nice person and, and just a total phony to me. All right, so. now, but you have to admit now, two years later, that Donald Trump is a complete phony. I mean, he, like, for instance, said that he was going to really, just one instance, that he would aggressively promote the infrastructure, the rebuilding of infrastructure in America. All I know is it seems like our bridges and roads are even in worse condition now than they were two years ago. Wow. So on that one important issue alone, he's abandoned us. They're, they're not in worse condition. He's two years in. So I mean, I, I you know, I don't know, I don't know what his infrastructure program's about. You know, his federal infrastructure because he has none. All right. So, so do you uh, now wish you had not voted for Donald Trump? No, I, I don't. I think Hillary would have been way worse. So I'm, I'm, I'm not. I, I, I would not take my vote. But listen, and my vote, as you know, in Chicago or Illinois, your vote didn't really count. We knew where it was going. It was more symbolic. It's that's all it was. So uh, all right. Let, let I mean, me... I, vote, I voted for Bernie the first time when it was Bernie and Hillary, and I, I'm, I'm not crazy about Bernie, but I just, I had such a dislike for Hillary. Now let me ask you this. Just think about that for a moment. You just got finished saying that in your humble opinion, the Democratic Party has gone so far to the left that it's falling in the ocean. Yeah. And I, at which point I said, I think the Democratic Party has moved too far to the right. And you go, Ben, we're just going to disagree. And now you tell me you voted for Bernie Sanders, who's so far to the left, he's not even in the Democratic I know, Party. Well, I know, but he, you know, he was not Hillary. Let's put it that way. So. <laughs> well, I'm not Hillary. Why didn't you vote for me? <laughs> well, you didn't run. <laughs> you should run. Guy like you, you know. You'd be a cinch. <laughs> uh, Nick Spasato is my guest. He's the alderman of the 38th Ward. And as he has acknowledged, uh, I didn't even have to feed him truth serum. He openly admits he voted for Donald John Trump in 2016. All right. You must at least be a bit. You're a good union man, folks. People who are going to trash me and say, why'd you put Nick Spasato on this show? And don't, you should throw Nick Spasato on the bus. I'm going to say this. Spasato is a good union I, man on that i'm not a good i'm a proud and active no, nobody nobody is a stronger union member and this council than me they could say they're pro union i'm a 41 year proud and active union member i still pay my union dues for my firefighters union which i don't have to i still participate in everything they do so there's a big difference between somebody saying i'm pro union and never been in a union or somebody like me that's been in a union for 41 years now actually this april will be 41 years so Proud and active. There's a big difference between being pro-union and a proud and active union member. All right, fair enough. And uh, as also, I should point out that uh, Nick Spasato is one of the few aldermen who stood with Karen Lewis and the striking teachers. I always point this out. In 2012, you were there. I uh, remember that uh, there was a Sunday rally at the Daily Plaza, and you got on the stage. I remember that very clearly. Nick Spasato yeah, was well, there. Yeah, there, well, there was like the eight of us, Fioretti, uh, Wagaspak. Um, well, eight Arena. out of 50 is pretty poor. Yeah, I know. Okay, eight out of 50 is pretty poor. All right, uh, so that said, I'm leading to this. You voted for Donald John Trump. You must have been disgusted by the Donald Trump's support uh, of the Janus decision. You must be disgusted by the, the votes of the anti-union votes of the Supreme Court justices that he's put on the Supreme Court. You, that must really rub you raw that the man you voted for for president would put such anti-union jurists, if you can even call them that, uh, on the Supreme Court. Yeah, well, I mean, it's disappointing. I mean, you figure it was going to happen, but you, you weigh you weigh everything out, and is 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 the 
you know, the union thing, the social thing more important? It's, it's a tough thing. I think if either, and of course you think they're not left enough to uh, uh, Democrats, but if the Democrats could come to the middle more or the Republicans could come to the middle more, I mean, if I think if the Republicans became pro-union, that would be the end of the Democrats. And I think if the uh, Democrats a little got a little more socially conservative, that would be the end of the Republicans. So, uh, but neither one of them is going to budge. So. We, well, uh, let me ask you this. If Bernie Sanders had run against Donald Trump, who would you have voted for? Uh, Donald Trump. Over Bernie Sanders? Yeah. Yeah, he's a little wacky for me. <laughs> but you, la- you agree he's... Bernie Sanders yeah, upholds know, but, all the union principles yeah, I know, that he, you believe in. He upholds all the union principles. There's no, there's no doubt about it. If but you vote for Donald socially, Trump... He- socially, he's just, you know, we're, on, we're in different stratospheres, so... All right, let's get into some of those social issues. We have time to continue to go with the social. Let's go to the social. What is it about the social positions of the Democratic Party uh, that uh, infuriate you? Uh, what a Second Amendment, for starters. I mean, it's, uh, they're certainly anti-Second Amendment. Um, what do you mean by anti-Second Amendment? I've never heard a Democrat ever once call for the abolition of the Second I know not one Democrat who's called for the abolition of the Second Amendment. Do you go? I don't I'm know. ask anybody in this studio. We- we Nobody might, knows. We must be watching uh, different things because they're always trying to take away our Second Amendment rights. To- well, wait a minute. Hold on. There's a difference between calling for a modicum of some like common sense gun laws and uh, the abolition of the Second Amendment. Well, everybody's for common sense gun laws, but what are they? I mean, so the so the, the, the what the NRA says and then what the what the Democrats say are, are different things. So, I mean, what is the what is the common sense gun? Do law- you think there should be background checks? Yes. Okay, there you go. Yeah. I mean, what, you're yeah. a Democrat. Yeah. What's the matter with that? No, there's nothing wrong with that. Background checks, yeah, background, right? Right. If someone, do you believe that a person who has committed a felony, who has used a gun to commit a felony, gets out of jail, should be allowed to continue owning a gun? Absolutely not. Oh, you're like a Democrat, okay. Nick. Well, I am Why a you Democrat. Hanging around with I've never pulled a Republican bailer. Remember that? So, all right. So where uh, where do you think the Democrats go too far in this? I, they, just, they just seem to be anti Second Amendment. Being that they want to take our the, our gun rights away. So, but you here when I get specific, when I ask you specific questions about policies, you favor the Democratic position and not the Republican one. So it seems as though it's just sort of like a general emotional thing you have, but it's not based on anything specific. Okay, you got me. I don't. I mean, <laughs> I mean uh, that's one of my favorite lines. Yeah. You've got me there. Uh, all right, what other social issues uh, are there that uh, force you uh, to sort of be reluctant supporter of Democrats? Well, abortion's a big one. I mean, so especially now, uh, late term and partial birth abortion is a really bothersome to me. I mean, uh, even many of my Democratic friends say that they're okay with the early on abortion, but certainly not after uh, the first trimester or whatever. So I just think a late term or a partial birth, and then now this new is it called infanticide? I mean, I don't know exactly how to say the word, infanticide, whatever it is, where they just, the baby comes out and they don't do anything to revive it and they just let it die, so. Are you against abortion in any situation? Well, you know, um, I mean, the big argument is rape and incest. Everybody brings up the less than 1%. How about rape and incest? I'll give you, I'll give you rape and incest if you give me late-term and partial birth. Can we make a deal that way? <laughs> so I'll give up. I'll say, okay, you can have your late-term and partial birth. I'm, I'm sorry, you can have your rape and uh, incest if I can have late-term and partial birth. So let's let's compromise there then, all right? Well, so, I don't know so, if I should be the person making the deal. I think well, the woman should be the one making that deal. Uh, you know, it's it's actually a woman's body. It is a woman's body, but uh, who's going to protect the unborn child? So, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm a protector of the unborn child. All right, and, and, and except in the case of rape or incest. Right, then I, then I would say it's up to the woman if a woman wants to have it, but I don't know that a woman should go through that traumatic experience of bearing a child. Maybe she wants to put it up for abortion. I mean, I, I find it hard to believe many women, if they were raped, would want to have a child and raise that kid, but it has happened, I know that, um, but I, you know. But now, is that's this- That's a tough call, but you know, liberals always bring up that same thing all the time. It's less than 1%, Ben, you know that. Not even close to 1%, but everybody brings up, how about rape and incest? But you never say anything about late term or partial birth abortion, so. Uh, well, and I, I don't mean you personally. Yeah, but, I understand you know, what you're I mean saying. Liberal. I mean, I would love to have you come on with Terry Cosgrove sometime and have this debate. Uh, Terry Cosgrove from uh, Personal Pack. Uh, it would be a very interesting debate. All right, uh, is that issue enough to get you to break from the Democratic Party, the issue of abortion? 
Uh, the differences you have with the the platform of the Democratic Party, is that enough to get you to break from the Democrats? Uh, you know, I'm not a one platform person. I know many of my family members and friends are. They're, they're a single issue or one platform uh, voter. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not a single issue or one platform voter. I look at a few few social issue things. So. All right, now let's talk about uh, the uh, the issue of uh, Chicago as a sanctuary city. Uh, Carlos Ramirez Rose has been very critical of you on this point. He, of course, is the alderman of the 35th Ward. You've been very critical of Car Carlos as well. No, 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 no. I was critical of what he said about me. I was never been critical of Carlos. I'm, I, I was friendly with Carlos. I actually, I actually, my union showed me their endorsements. They missed about 25 of my colleagues. And I'm like, look, you're missing a lot of good people. And Carlos was one of them. And I said, you know, you should back this guy, him along with other people. It wasn't, he wasn't the only guy. I said, you guys should back these people. And then Carlos, because I was back and I was at a, a um, an endorsement for Lori Lightfoot. And then right away he's blasting me and saying lies about me. That's when everything, that's when the you know what hit the fan. Yeah. So you, you, know, you know what I said. I don't deny what I said about yeah. him. So. Well, you, you, you did you tweet I know. it or you can, can I say it on here? Uh, yeah, it's a podcast. You can right, actually, podcast. we're not on the, we're not literally right. on the, so, so you I can say, yeah, yeah. So that's when the shit hit the fan. So, right, yeah. Right. And so, uh, <laughs> you can yeah. say it on this show. Right, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, he, you know, he called me out for back in Lori Lightfoot that I'm a helpful, I'm anti-immigrant. I am not anti-immigrant, okay? Mm -hmm. I am anti-illegal immigration, okay? That's what I am. We have a, a process in this country and everybody needs to follow that process. I'm all for resolving this issue. Ten, eight to 10 years ago, a certain president had an opportunity to resolve all of this stuff and it was never done. You know that, I know that, everybody knows that, nothing was done. So I'm all for resolving this. I feel for these people. I have three friends whose wives are illegal. I have a friend that's here illegal. I didn't know till you know, a year or two ago. So I feel for these people. They're all hardworking, good people. But I mean, we have a process here. We can't just say, okay, you're jumping the line or you're okay, but he's not okay. But I'm all for figuring this out, maybe having an amnesty program and say, okay, here's your opportunity. As long as you obeyed the law, as long as you don't have any criminal uh, charges against you, you didn't steal anybody's identity, you know, whatever. You don't, you didn't crash a car and uh, do a bunch of damage to somebody. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why the far, the far majority of the people that come here Ill, are illegal are hardworking, honest, good people, but we cannot have open borders in this country. And when Obama and Trump say this, nobody had a problem with it. But when Nick Spazzato, I'm sorry, when Obama and, uh, and uh, Clinton say it, mm -hmm. when Nick Spazzato or Trump say it, then people say we're haters, we're this, we're that. And I do have Obama's speech and Clinton's speech with me if you want me to read it to you. I know, it, I know you know what they are, but I'm more than willing to, to read it. So All right, wait, that was before, okay. Before we go on into uh, the inconsistencies of the Democrats, on this issue, and and uh, I didn't come on here to bash Democrats. No, no, I mean, I, I just, I just yeah, you are a Democrat. I know I'm a Democrat. It, it, you may be a self-hating Democrat. I'm, I'm an unusual Democrat. I'm, I'm a guy that's trying to find his identity right now. Me and a, and, a, and a whole load of my friends that are just like, you know, this isn't a party that we knew 40 years ago. And I and I was at a party about a year ago, and I saw two old-time state reps. And at the time, I had just given up the committeeman thing, and both of those old timers come up to me and says, "That was that was good. You did that, Nick." He goes, "This party is not the not the party that we used to represent, and we knew and everything else." So Nick, I'm not, not going to say their names. I, so. I got to I have to say this. I'm older than you, so I've been hearing this. Not debate much, for, but, but but enough to know. How I've been are hearing. You? Oh, I'm in my 60s, young man. Oh, I saw my. Oh, okay, well, then maybe we're the same age. All right. Uh, so, I've been hearing this argument raised by conservative Democrats for going back to 1968. This is not our party. So when you say 40 years ago, already this argument was being raised by the Demo by people in the Democratic Party. Already these conflicts were at, uh, at play in the Democratic Party. 1972 was the, 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 the election, and in many ways the party fell apart. Here in Chicago, the city of Chicago, where you grew up, Mayor Daley uh, the Democrats, George Montgomery kicked Mayor Daley out of the convention, if you recall. Many Democrats openly supported Richard Nixon in the, in the way that you voted for Donald Trump. Many Democrats, Vito Marzullo, who was the alderman of the 25th Ward, uh, endorsed Richard Nixon. So this division that you're talking about, it, it's not like it's new. You understand what I'm saying, yeah. Nick? It's not like this right. is something, it's just something that you're engaging with for the first time for various reasons. Right. Yeah. So when we get to the issue, okay, so Democrats, I, I admit, have been inconsistent on the issue of immigration. But you have to admit that Donald Trump 
has played this way in such a way as to bring out like divisions, racial divisions and ethnic divisions and play one group of people or for another people, try to get people fired up using hate well, as opposed. I, I'm not here to be an apologist for Donald Trump. So I mean, so we, we could go round and round and uh, around is all we want. Um, you know, whoever my president is, I support him. So I, I, I supported Obama, I supported uh, Bush. Um, even though Clinton was the president, I still supported him. I'm, I'm an American who supports the president, stands behind him. Even if I disagree with what they're doing, you'll never see me going down the street, busting windows or something because somebody got elected, disrupting anything. I don't even put stuff on Facebook, Ben. I, I don't tweet, but I don't put stuff on Facebook. I never put negative political stuff about anybody, you know, if I, if I disagree with them or not. So even though I'm supporting a mayoral candidate in this race, I will never, ever put anything negative about her opponents. All right, that's Nick Spazzato, Alderman of the 38th Ward. He raises the mayor's race. We'll uh, bring that up. Uh, we'll, we'll take a break. We'll bring that up, and we'll bring Miles back into the conversation, see what he has to say. Two native sons of Chicago sitting right next to each other. One's from Beverly, one's from the northwest side. We'll be right back after this. Hey there, producer Dennis here. Thanks for finding and listening to the brand new Ben Jarofsky Show. All right, so here's how this works. The Ben Jarofsky Show live streams on the Chicago Sun-Times YouTube channel Tuesday through Friday, 1 until 3 p.m. Once the show is over, you can listen to the replay on our YouTube channel, or we throw it online for you to download by 4 p.m. Where can you download the Ben Jarofsky Show, you may be asking yourself? Well, you may be asking yourself a fantastic question. You can find previous Ben Jarofsky shows and guest interviews through several outlets. The Chicago Sun-Times Online, chicago.suntimes.com. The Chicago Reader Online, chicagoreader.com. And wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, pick one. Just search for The Ben Jarofsky Show, J-O-R-A, V as in victory, S-K-Y. So... Let's recap. Tuesday through Friday, 1 until 3 p.m., live streamed on the Chicago Sun-Times YouTube channel and downloadable by 4 at chicago.suntimes.com, chicagoreader.com, and wherever else you listen to your favorite podcast. Yes, the Ben Jarofsky Show is back. We're live and downloaded. Tell your friends and enjoy the rest of the show. Hi, this is Nick Offerman. I'm taking my show on the road and subjugating an audience to my humor. All rise, American humorist Nick Offerman is coming September 15th on stage at the Chicago Theater. It's an evening of deliberative talking and light dance that will compel you to chuckle while enjoining you to brandish a better side of humanity than the one to which we have grown accustomed. Reserved seats are on sale noon Friday, March 22nd at the box office or at Ticketmaster.com. Don't miss Nick Offerman live hey welcome back to the ben jarofsky show benny j take it away all right we'll do 38th ward alderman nick spasato in the studio miles comp lassen uh, ace political writer and editor for in these times as well miles has been sitting back quietly listening to my conversation with nick now we're going to bring him in we're going to have a more general conversation about the upcoming mayoral race but before we do that what you got from a young man? I think Miles was taking notes. I'm seeing got a lot of notes <laughs> yeah. there. It's awesome. He's been writing away. <laughs> this guy's going to eat us up, man. <laughs> We're just talking off the cuff here, and he's like taking uh, notes. Uh, he's got yeah. a full page. He knows. It. Just spell the name right. Okay, right. what you got for me? Right now, we're uh, having our second Nick Offerman ticket giveaway. Nick Offerman's going to be at the Chicago Theater Sunday, September 15th. Uh, yesterday, we did uh, nine famous Nicks. If people could name five or nine other people with the uh, famous people named Nick. Nick Spazzato. Oh, there yeah. we go. No one put Nick Spazzato <laughs> on there. Man. Shut up. Yeah. Nick Nolte made it, but yeah, not Nick right, Spazzato. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, but no, Erin uh, won yesterday's contest. She named nine famous Nicks very easily. Our second contest, well, it's Suggestions for Ben. Boy, oh. I wish I would have came up with a better name for that, but yeah. whatever. Suggestions for Ben. Uh, what movie should Ben watch next on Netflix? This guy <laughs> loves Netflix. He doesn't do the streaming. He gets them mailed. Yeah. Because he's old. Wait, but, time hey. out. I love the old 
uh, just clarification. The old video stores, I know I'm ancient, oh, yeah. but I loved video stores. I used to go hang around with yep. the geeks behind the talk movies with those guys, you know what yep. I'm saying? So, so this is the best I have is this thing that comes through the mail anyway. Blackbuster right. was an awesome place back in the day. I even liked before Blackbuster when it was just like, you know, Neighborhood like stores, Bobby's yeah. Video Shack or whatever. <laughs> All right, so suggestions for Ben. What movies should, or what movie should Ben watch next on Netflix? If Ben picks your suggestion, you win the tickets. We're going to keep this open for all of our downloaders. Uh, I got a few movies here uh, right. that people have suggested. How about the movie Blind Spotting? Have you seen Blind Spotting? I've uh, not seen Blind Spotting, but I know all about. I'm not sure if I'm ready to handle Blind Spotting. It's based on a novel and it's kind of graphic and all that. But uh, all right. Jennifer sent that one. All right. Uh, let's see here. Kristen put. But uh, I'm pretty sure it's on Netflix, but didn't double check. Highly recommend Sing Street. Great flick with a fantastic soundtrack. Sing Street. Uh, I've heard of Sing. I'm positive that would be. Here's, folks, this is something you should know. We'll give you a little tip out there. Uh-oh. All you millennials out there, you think all that streaming is for you. Actually, if you really want to watch an old movie or you want to see a movie that's a, 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 a documentary, the old-fashioned through the mail far greater range of choices. Anybody will tell you that. So uh, if you, Sing Street is probably something I could rent, but not download. All right, we'll do two more here. Brian went on to Twitter. He put Polar. Polar? I heard of Polar. L-A-R. Polar. Oh, all right, write it down. Here. We're going to write all of these down, by the way, everybody. And finally, Daniel suggests on Twitter the movie Hot Fuzz. Hot Fuzz. I've seen Hot Fuzz. That's a good movie. I read it through uh, through Twitter, through Netflix. Hot Fuzz is a funny movie. So what movie should Ben Jarofsky watch next on Netflix? You send us a suggestion. We're going to keep this open until tomorrow's show. Send them now at Benny J Show on Twitter, at Benny J Show on Facebook. Ben, when he if he picks your suggestion, you win tickets to see Nick Offerman. Good luck. All right, very good. All right, Nick Spisato, Alderman of 38th Ward, Miles Comp Lassen from In These Times. We'll start with you, Nick. You endorsed Lori Lightfoot for mayor of the city of Chicago. Am I correct on that? Nope. I you're, feel you're, clarification you're, you're, you're coming clarification on. once again, Ben. You're not on your A game today. Okay. You wanted me to be on my A game. My union endorser, and I stood up my union for an endorsement for Lori Lightfoot. So Fair enough. I okay. did. Nick Spazzato and Anthony Napolitano did not have our endorsement for uh, Lightfoot. We are certainly supporting her. We stand with our union. My mind was made up in this uh, mayoral race. that was torn between staying out, but then I, we said we're going to go with whoever our union goes I with. I see. It could have been either one of them. could have just as easily have been Preckwinkle. They chose Lightfoot. I had no idea who they were going to pick. We said we were standing with our union. When they backed her, they asked us to come out. I, I honestly and truly am who I am and where I am because of my union, firefighters. Never would have thought people would vote for somebody because they're a firefighter. And now, three years in a row, you have a firefighter elected, me being the first, of course. Well, all right. So did the firefighters uh, weigh in on any of the, I just can't remember this, Nick. Did they weigh in on anybody in the first round? No, they stayed out of it. That was per my advice. And... Uh, uh, they like my advice. And Remember the advice out. I gave you guys four years ago? Don't inv- endorse Rob. You guys didn't listen to me four years ago, Nick. Remember that one? I Nick Spazzato to- stayed out of that race, if you remember correctly. Uh, so. right. Okay. All right. Nick Nick was with Fioretti in the first round because Fioretti was one of my best friends. And then in a the runoff, I just stayed out of it. All right. So who- and actually, Ram and me became pretty good friends the second four years as opposed to the first four years. All right. We'll get into that one later. If it's yeah. okay to be friends with the guy, you don't have to support his stuff. All right. But let me ask you this. Uh, did you support anybody in the first round? Yeah, Susanna Mendoza is one of my oh, one of my one of my best friends in politics. She lives in my ward. I mean, I, of course, I support her. So she lives in the thirty eighth, and she's one of my best friends in politics. So. All right, so I'm going to direct the question. Yeah, I thought we were going to try to bring Susanna on the show. I will get Susanna oh. on the show. I reached out to Susanna oh, Mendoza's you. people. Thank you for that booking guest for the Ben Jarofsky <laughs> yeah. show. Uh, Nick Spazzano, I did reach out to Susanna. I'm still waiting to hear from you, Susanna. Uh, mm-hmm. Susanna was a guest on the show all the time uh, back in the day. All right, Miles, what's your thoughts about this when you hear uh, that the firefighters have endorsed Lori Lightfoot in general? How does this play into you know how unions have been uh, uh, getting involved in this campaign? Well, I think that at this point in the race, there's – uh, I think a lot of organizations and individuals are probably seeing the, where the poll numbers are and making their decisions slightly based on that um, and who they think is going to be their best ally, who they want to have um, working alongside them. <clears throat> Firefighters got in early, though, Miles, just so I yeah, clarify yeah. that. So we, yeah. we, we weren't a bandwagon jumpers. We well, you weren't in, involved in the first round. We jumped in round. early. No, they weren't. Because no, yeah. there's 14 people. So I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to correct you, but yeah, yeah we, we jumped in a while ago. So. Right. 
Well, the uh, you know one group that jumped in a long time ago is the Chicago Teachers Union, who was very clearly out uh, with with Tony Preckwinkle. I think they saw her as the best advocate for their agenda, which was you know to elect the school board, to stop the expansion of charter schools, um, to basically end privatization of education in Chicago. And now that's become uh, an agenda item that. Uh, Lori Lightfoot has generally signed on to. I think what has caused a lot of concern for people around um, what's happened since the runoff, be- uh, since you know the first round of voting ended, is the dynamics of the race. And there's been some, you know, there was a WBEZ investigation that looked at a forty thousand dollars in dark money that Lori Lightfoot took from this organization, Chain Chicago, and with it's unclear who was uh, behind that. It seems to fly in the face of some of the claims of like let in the light when you know, there's a dark money group that's actually supporting her. There's also that guy, John Canning, who gave her a large amount of money, who previously was supporting Bill Daly, had been supporting Bruce Rauner for a long time as well. Um, and her recent uh, statement about wanting to turn some of the, pl- the closed public schools uh, in Chicago into smaller police academies mm-hmm. in response to this debate over the $95 million police academy on the west side that the city council recently voted on. Um, those are some issues that I think are bringing up new uh, concerns in the race about it, whether Lori Lightfoot is the progressive uh, candidate in the race, which has been what she's been running on for for a long time now. You know, for the record, uh, when Lori was on the show on Friday, she really backed off on that the police academy thing. I asked her about that. She was on the show uh, Friday. Uh, Nick, in regards to what Miles says, do you have concerns that Lori Lightfoot will remain true uh, to her commitments to believing in collective bargaining rights for unions? Mm. Uh, once in office, do you think she'll pull a Jane Byrne? I don't know if you're, you're yes, you must remember yes. how Jane Byrne yes, turned against Yes, it was 1980, the, yes. Right. I was 21 years old in 1980. So. Yeah, and she turned against the firefighters, yes. and we had a strike in this city for how many days? 23 was, days. Very good for knowing that. And uh, she, a lot of firefighters still... In fact, there's still firefighters who came on the job as a result of that 1980 strike, if you recall, and they were ostracized. By, mm-hmm. So there's a lot of problems from, uh, do, yeah. you, do you have any concerns in the back of your mind that Lori Lightfoot might pull a Jane Byrne on you? Yeah, head? no, I, I don't know. I don't have an opinion one way or another. I mean, I would hope not. I hope people would hold true to what, they, what got them elected. So uh, I, I'm really not sure. I mean, I don't know her that well. I think uh, both women are intelligent women, and you know, either one of them could run the city, and so... You know, we'll see what happens. I mean, well, well, one issue that is going to come up is the the teachers contract is going to be is is up in the, in the and firefighters and, 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 and cops. police. Yeah, all three, all three of them, big it's ones. Gonna, yeah, yeah, and there's a, clearly the there's been a lot of talk about pensions and the pension issue in the city. And I, you know, I personally strongly believe pension is a promise, and that that's a core element of believing in workers' rights is holding true to the commitments that you've made to them. Um, I think what Laurie has suggested is potentially holding true to the promises that have been made, but then cutting back on pensions going forward. It's hard for me to see how we're gonna retain public sector workers if we're not offering them a secure retirement. So I think that that's one issue that we're gonna, that people are gonna have to look at when these contracts are for negotiation and that if Lori Lightfoot is the next mayor of Chicago, is she going to stand with uh, working people or is it gonna be a more uh, oppositional relationship? Well, let me just point out here, Nick Spazzato knows what I'm about to say is true. The Democratic Party is coming sort of out of, uh, under, I always call it, they were drinking that rom Kool-Aid, and they're coming out from the influence of that sort of right wing. Remember I said I thought the Democrats were too right, you said they're too left? Yep. In, uh, Ten years ago, all the Democrats, including Tony Preckwinkle, were lining up uh, to k- take away uh, municipal workers' pensions, dilute their pensions. Tony Prickwinkle had her own proposal down there in Springfield to to, to uh, hurt the uh, pensions of uh, people who work for the county. SEIU was very concerned about that at the time. And your boy Rom was going to firehouses, Nick. He was going to firehouses and telling firefighters, guys, I hate to do this, but I'm going to have to take your pensions away because we can't afford them. Remember that? Mm, yeah, yep. I think he was talking about a two-tier, but yeah. Yeah, well, no, he was talking more about going down state, state and changing the pension laws. He tried to do that with that pension bill of his. So um, it was unconstitutional. It was unco- uh, ultimately was ruled unconstitutional. I give the firefighters credit for standing up to him. Uh, I thought that was very disrespectful for him to come to firehouses, tell firefighters he's going to take their pension, particularly when he's backed by bodyguards, Nick, okay? You know, it's not like he walked in off the street. Most, most firemen ain't afraid of too many things, so they're not worried about his bodyguards, believe me. So. All right, well, they may be worried about a boss who could transfer him to a firehouse on the other just, side of the just city. Just on a side note, the, the firefighters uh, beat the police almost every year in the boxing <laughs> match, so, but, 
you know, just glad. in case you want to go out glad. April <laughs> April 12th to the police fire boxing match at De La Salle. So feel free to stop on by. All right, that's, that's April. I'm a fight fan. All right, but so Nick, are you concerned? As Miles points out, that the next uh, mayor of the city of Chicago will go back to that old uh, sort of uh, rom cool. Yeah, well, it's it's always a concern of mine. I mean, we'll just have to wait and see. I'm not going to be telling people that uh, you're going, you know, you should do this or that, or you're not going to do this or that. So, I mean, right now it's going to be a wait and see who gets elected, and we're going to see what happens from there. And believe me, whoever it is, I'll get a lot of pressure from a lot of people. So, all right, now let's talk about this issue of aldermanic prerogative. This has been emerged. Uh, in the last uh, few months uh, as, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I personally uh, do not believe it exists. I think it's a made-up, manufactured issue. Uh, I'd love to get both of your thoughts on this. We'll start with uh, you, Nick. Well, I support all the manic prerogative because I know my ward much better than Miles, who lives in Beverly, does. And, and he knows his ward better than I do living in, in, in Dunning and Portage. So, um, of course, I support it. I, I don't know why. I you know Some people act like they don't support it, they, but everybody supports it. Nobody wants anybody weighing in on their own projects. And, you know... Uh, Privately, I bet you would see 50 people would say they support it. Depends on what time you'd have a vote on or whatever, and, and you'd, you'd see the fire majority that who knows my ward better than me, and there hasn't ever been any real problems in my ward, and as there, as is most wards, so. Miles, what's your thoughts on all Well, I think that there's so many. Um, just look at the Lincoln Yards project, for example. This is a project that's going to impact uh, the entire city, and it's, as we mentioned, the largest private TIF um, ever in the history of Chicago, if that ends up going through. The construction of it is going to be essentially another little mini downtown uh, along the waterfront there. That's going to have massive impacts across the city. It's not just Brian Hopkins who's going to be impacted by that. And so I think when it comes to so many issues, the um, police academy we mentioned earlier and uh, Emma, Whip, Emma Mitz Ward, the 78 they're trying to build in the South Loop, these are massive development projects that one uh, public officials, I don't think, should have a uh, say over what which which way it goes. I don't think that that's necessarily a matter of uh, p- you know policy around prerogative or you know when it comes to how people view their colleagues on the city council. I think it's more about having a more democratic approach to public policy that's going to impact so many people's lives. If we are taking you know a billion dollars in TIF funds and throwing it towards uh, a giant luxury development. Uh, that's going to be less money for public schools. That's going to be less money that we can inject into the coffers of the the city that we desperately need to fund the services that people are relying on. All right, now Miles, you're starting to sound like me. Uh, and uh, let me say, this is gets to the point why I don't believe aldermanic prerogative really exists in the city of Chicago. I think it's a phony issue that has been created. I won't even talk about what Mayor Rahm did to Nick Spisato back in uh, in 2011 with the UNO school. We'll put that to his side. Nick knows that history as well as anybody. Very good. Brian Hopkins, the alderman of the second ward, you're absolutely correct, Miles, uh, supports Lincoln Yards. All right? He's probably the most, the loudest, most forceful supporter of that project. I think Everybody in this room agrees on that point. However, if, if you could imagine this, if Brian Hopkins was against Lincoln Yards, it still would be going through the city council. Mayor Rahm would be pushing that baby through the city council, just like Mayor Daly shoved the Chicago Children's Museum down Alderman Riley's throats back in 2007 because i don't know what i'm talking about he's nodding his head just like mayor rom shoved the uno school down nick spazato's throat down in 2011 even though he didn't want it he made D- danny solis force that vote over the opposition of the local alderman the point is this yes you're absolutely correct lincoln in my humble opinions lincoln yards is a waste of money and uh, the tip dollars the property tax dollars should be spent other words but I do not believe that Brian Hopkins, the kid alderman from the second ward, he's a rookie alderman, Nick Spazato. Well, he's not a kid, though. He's like 54 years old. So. All right. Well, everybody younger than and, me is And a he's kid. been around politics his whole life. so He's still a rookie alderman. He's a rookie alderman. Okay. All right. He did work for John Daly at the county, but he's a rookie alderman. Yeah. If he was against Lincoln Yards, Nick Spazato, and Mayor Rahm was for it, do you think Mayor Rahm would go, oh, 
Alderman prerogative. I got to let, I'm sorry, uh, Sterling Bay, I'm going to kill this $1.3 billion deal. Yeah, well, I know where he would be, but I don't know where the rest of, the, rest of his colleagues would be. I mean, I certainly would have stood with Brian if he was against it, as I'm standing with him as he's for it. So, I mean, there's one thing we didn't mention here. So, yes, we know a billion dollars in TIS, but this is for infrastructure, for one. Two, it's $10,000 union construct. I'm sorry, 10,000 union construction jobs and 25,000 permanent jobs. I mean, we're almost building another city, like like you said a little earlier. I mean, that, that area is going to be a little small city. So I would um, say to the good people of Dunning and Portage and Beverly, hey, man, well, let's go fix your streets. I'll take those union jobs and I'll go fix the streets in Beverly where there's potholes and Mount Greenwood where there's potholes and, Port- and Dunning where there's potholes. We got bridges that are falling apart on Lakeshore Drive, Nick Spisato. I'll take that money and fix the the bridges that are falling apart why don't we fix what we have before we build new things don't you always tell your kids don't eat your chocolate cake until you eat your vegetables right isn't that what we say nick spazzato that's right all right that's well just- as, along with that i mean we, we could have union jobs building affordable housing building public housing that doesn't we don't have to build giant the skyscrapers along the river in order to you know get union work or in order to improve infrastructure that's right. just that's a false choice I, I agree with you on that point but i just want to get this point clear are all we are we all in agreement that aldermen and prerogative would go out the window uh i'll get i'll concede that you would be the one of the aldermen who would vote with brian hopkins if brian hopkins were against lincoln yard and mayor rom and david reefman and sterling bay wanted it would all would the other uh, alderman go? Yeah, I, well, I don't know what the other ones would do. I can only tell you what I would do. So, because I know what happened to me, so I knew the only way to stop them was to get the zoning committee people on my side. And only four people stood with me, said they would support me. And oddly enough, these are four people that a particular union's been against. So, um, but yeah, only four people. Somebody said, "Yeah, talk to the members of the zoning committee. Get them on your side, and it won't go through." I was a rookie alderman. I, I had like six months on the job, but not even six months, less than that. And I didn't know how to handle this. Nobody really pulled me under their wing and did, but they said one thing to do, talk to the zoning members and get them to go against it. And everybody I talked to, it was really only Fioretti and uh, Kappelman and Pawar and Cullerton said, uh, if, if you're against it, we'll stand with you. And that was it. So wow. out of a, whatever, a 17 person zoning committee, that, that was all I could get. So then I had to try to cut my losses. And of course, as you know, what he said about me uh, at the zoning meeting and everything. So. All right, let's just give a little, just so people know what we're talking about here, a little help here. It's because it took place about 10 years ago, Miles. Uh, in 2011, Mayor Rahm came into office and he wanted to expand charter schools all over the city of Chicago. And he wanted to uh, put a UNO charter school branch uh, in Nick's ward. Nick was opposed to it. it came down to a zoning matter. Uh, they needed the zoning approval. And Nick asked, as the alderman of the ward, that uh, they hold off on changing the zoning uh, because he was against the charter school. At least he needed more time to talk to people in the community right. if they wanted a zoning. Mayor Rahm, at the time, the head of the zoning committee was a guy named Danny Solis. We all know who Danny Solis is. He we was, don't know where he is. Though. We don't know. He's probably in witness protection, but uh, we don't know where he is. And uh, essentially, they threw Alderman and Prerogative out the window because Mayor Rahm wanted that, uh, that was a very school. strong-fisted mayor i think that that is at a weaker position in his mayorship right now and so you know if he uh if if hopkins did come out strongly against lincoln yards i gotta say really quick that was a as an anecdote i was at one of the public meetings about lincoln yards they held hundreds of people there this meeting lasted over three hours long this is back when they still had the giant live nation amphitheater in the, in the mm-hmm. plant um so it's so a couple months ago but this meeting it was a public meeting that they specifically had, in order, and at this time, Hopkins was still saying he wasn't sure. He was not coming out in support of it. Every single person came out in opposition uh, to the project because they, they had people speaking from the from the community. Granted, this is when the you know civil organization was happening, and they were bringing in some defenders of the hideout and so forth. But these were people from the community. They said what neighborhood they were from when they announced themselves. The only person that spoke in support of it was a young guy from uh, who said that all of his, he said he's a DePaul student, and all of his friends are excited to bring their, uh, their, their friends to come see their college towns. And he wished Chicago, could be, he could be proud to show people Chicago, but he was, had nowhere to show them that Chicago was a great city. That, really? was his, that was his defense of Lincoln Yards, and he said, this seems great, I could come show my friends from Boulder <laughs> Lincoln Yards. And I said, oh my God, this is the defense of this project. It wasn't and, a very good defense. <laughs> no. <and laughs> a lot so, of good places to take people in Chicago. So, Of course, and, and this is, shouldn't that, shouldn't the, the, the actual representative, the elected representatives, the alderman be representing their community? 
the people of uh, the second ward are not in favor of Lincoln Yard. So why do we, you know, invest so much in what Mayor Rahm Manuel is going to be out of office very soon and what Brian Hopkins have to say when it's against what his actual constituents well, want? Well, Miles, that is one particular meeting. I wasn't there at any of them. I've talked to Hopkins. It's, you know, about this. I talked to Reefman about this. So he's telling me that the community is for it. So uh, you're saying they're against it. You're at a meeting with 300 people. I, I, I 100% believe you, but I also 100% believe Brian that he said he's had, you know, 50, 60 meetings about this. The people were against it kind of in the beginning. Now they're more in favor of it. They are the height of some of the buildings they had issues with. The height's going down. Um, some people want it more affordable. That's went up. So. All right. And I'll say this before we go to break. Uh, I think it should be a citywide decision because this is property tax dollars that we are all paying. So I'm going to say this to the good people, the 38th Ward, your taxes are going to go up for Lincoln Yards. You may not think they're going to go up for Lincoln Yards, but even Nick's going, yeah, they're going to go up for Lincoln Yards because it's a TIFF deal. All right, we got Nick Spazzato, we got Miles Conflassen in the studio. We're going to take one last break, and we're going to close it up. If you would like to advertise with The Ben Jarofsky Show, and who wouldn't, contact Tracy Bame at publisher at chicagoreadercorp.com. We have several advertising options for your business or organization, and quite frankly, we would love nothing more than to tell our listeners all about it. Once again, that's Tracy Bame at publisher at chicagoreadercorp, that's C-O-R-P as in Paul, dot com to advertise with The Ben Jarofsky Show, The Chicago Reader, and The Chicago Sun-Times. We look forward to plugging you. Okay, well, that came out kind of weird. More of The Ben Jarofsky Show live and downloaded in moments. Hi, this is Nick Offerman. I'm taking my show on the road and subjugating an audience to my humor. All rise, American humorist Nick Offerman is coming September 15th on stage at the Chicago Theater. It's an evening of deliberative talking and light dance that will compel you to chuckle while enjoining you to brandish a better side of humanity than the one to which we have grown accustomed. Reserved seats are on sale noon Friday, March 22nd at the box office or at Ticketmaster.com. Don't miss Nick Offerman live welcome back to the ben jarofsky show uh yeah. mr jarofsky man take us home that's alderman nick spasato on the piano baby he can really oh, play people didn't know he could play the piano they, oh he's just a firefighter no he's not just a firefighter play chopsticks <laughs> <laughs> I love that song. That's really not Nick Spazzato on the piano. But uh, anyway, I just love that song so much. That means it's the close of another show. Great show it's been. Really enjoyed talking politics with Miles Conflassen uh, from In These Times and Alderman Nick Spazzato, the first Donald Trump voter who's ever been on the Ben Jarofsky show. <laughs> See, I got a you know open a uh, mind here, Mick. I'm Brett. Welcome and everybody. Honesty is very important to me, Ben. Uh, and uh, yes, indeed, I've known Nick Spazzato for a long time, and I'm not going to throw him under the bus uh, because he's politically unpopular in the city of Chicago. Miles, before uh, I let you get out of the studio, any closing thoughts? Anything you want to promote? Anything? Uh, any ideas or articles you want to tell us about? Go ahead. Well, one uh, thing I want to say about this election is that what we saw, I think, on February 26th, and what we're going to see again on April 2nd, is a real political transformation in the city. And a lot of people have just focused on the mayor's race, which is incredibly important, obviously. But and when it comes to these aldermanic races, we have seen grassroots organizations coalesce, labor, left groups, progressive organizations, unions, uh, IPOs, in an unprecedented way and put forward a real uh, strong left political platform. And it is not, you know, I talked earlier about not being about labels. It's been about priorities and prioritizing uh, the needs of working families over corporate interests that have dominated city politics for so long. So when we look at races like in the third, third ward where Rosana Rodriguez, the community organizer, came out on top of Deb Mel, they're going to run off in April 2nd. When we look to the 40th ward with Andre Vasquez and Pat O'Connor, um, as well as uh, races in the 25th ward with Byron Sicjo Lopez uh, going up against Alex Acevedo, we were seeing candidates that are from progressive community organizing backgrounds 
uh, benefiting from that on the ground support. And I think we have to, you know, you just have to say, you see, when you see 80 people out canvassing on a weekday for a candidate, clearly they have generated a lot of response and a lot of um, passion from the community. And that is what is going to drive change in the city going forward after April 2nd, too. Um, and I think we are going to see the beginnings of a real uh, challenge to the forces that have dominated this city for so long, which tend to be concentrated economic power groups like the CME group that have, you know, threatened the city any chance they can to get tax breaks and say they're going to move out. Well, people want to see clean water. They want to see uh, public schools that are accessible and that are fully funded. And I think that's going to happen if these community groups can keep putting pressure on their elected leaders. So that's the real story I take out of this election. It's not just that we have two African-American women running against each other for mayor. It's that we have seen a real political shift uh, in the city. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's uh, hope that has a, uh, a positive impact on the policies going forward. Uh, Nick uh, Spazzato, what's your thoughts about how things are going to change in the city of Chicago? Uh, under I'm, not, I'm not really sure how things are going to change at this point, but I will say about this past election, I'm somewhat disappointed about the turnout. Um, proud, prouder the way to, the, that it was, you know, four out of five people elected wrong minorities, and that kind of made me proud of the city. But one, you know, 34 percent of the people voted, and that was very disappointing. Uh, this is a very important election, folks. Get out and vote. I mean, a lot of people told me they're waiting to the runoff, so I don't know why anybody will wait to the runoff. But <laughs> okay, the runoff is here. Just get out and vote. Whoever you like, you have to like one over the other. Pick a candidate. Don't forget we have a treasurer's race here, and we also have 14 aldermanic races. So please, please, please get out and vote. Let's shoot for about 50% uh, voter turnout, which that shouldn't even be that big of a deal. But to me, it is now after uh, a third of the people voted. So All right. Very one, good. one last thing for me to plug before I go. Uh, I, as I said, uh, editor at In These Times. So go to InTheseTimes.com and read up on uh, our writing. Also, um, I, my uh, 90s cover band is performing uh, tomorrow night at Liz's Lizard Lounge in Albany Park around 8 p.m. So you, I did, you're a rock and roller? Uh, it, everybody should what, come what, on out. I did not know that. What, what instrument guitar, do you play? I play, I play the guitar, yeah. You look like a guitar okay. guy. I, I did not know I got an, I got an know SGX. That, everybody should come on out. It's going to be a party. Uh, Nick, are you a 90s guy in any way? Uh, no, I'm more of a 70s guy. So <laughs> Once I'm a Motown we, 70s we music guy. We are playing guy, a Fleetwood yeah. Mac song for what it's worth. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's all right. Which Fleetwood yeah. Mac song? It's, it's going to be Dream. So. I, I, uh, Dreams. Which one is Dreams? Is that their last song? Thunder or? Only you Happens When It's Oh, raining. that's Dreams? Yeah. I always thought it was Thunder <laughs> Only. Anyway, there you I've go. Heard See, come enough. on and sing along, Ben. We'll bring you on stage. <laughs> no, you definitely do not want that. No, I can you don't want that. <laughs> well, the crow is March 21st. All right, so, Lizard's Lizard Lounge. Uh, well, just give the folks at Lizard's Lounge, where is that at? It's, uh, it's, on, it's just east of Kedzie on Irving Park. Oh, okay, Albany just Park. east of Kedzie and Irving Park. I would believe that would probably be, Spazzato's going to tell me this, I'm wrong here. That 33rd would, Ward. Is that, is that Deb yeah. Mel's Ward? Yeah. Is it 33rd yeah. Ward? Okay, yeah. zigs and it zags. Lorino's Ward it's is hard, out there somewhere. As you know, wards aren't squares or rectangles anymore. Oh, so, uh, no. And, they're, and, they're, you look at some of these wards, you're just like, it's an, it's an embarrassment. It I'm really going to bring Nick Spazzato back. We're going to talk about ward redistricting okay. and the games people yeah. play in that yeah, one. Well, we right? got a little wait for that, but yeah. I mean, it's just two years down the road, Nick. Yeah. Or maybe three. Three, yeah, I'd say three. All right, Nick Spazzato of the 38th Ward. Uh, Miles, uh, I want to th just tell what everybody, come see Miles Conflass and rock and roll. <laughs> he not only covers politics for these times, but apparently plays the guitar as well. You can check him out uh, this weekend. Uh, the doctor, as always, a magnificent job behind the board. He is, again, ladies and gentlemen, the pride and joy of Alton, Illinois. The ladies all love him for his body and his mind, quote Otis Wilson. See you tomorrow, everybody. Thanks for having me, Ben. The Ben Jarofsky Show is brought to you by the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, Local 126 and District 8, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 9, and the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 150. Thank you once again to those unions. And, of course, today's show is brought to you by our friends at the Chicago Federation of Labor. Tomorrow on the program, we are giving away tickets to see Nick Offerman September 15th at the Chicago Theater. Just suggest a movie to, for Ben to watch on Netflix on either Twitter or Facebook at Benny J Show. If Ben picks your suggestion, you win the tickets. See you tomorrow.